Winter Parsley, Lucipio, J Flyer. Boys and girls, I got a. Uh, and not better. <laughs> I got some stories. truth about mike hello hello matrix bots hello jake state farm hello mooser hello Finavel. um hello nearby alarm new pb oh dancing gopher they were the five months lonely loaf they were 33 uh thoughtless or weak the unorganized chatter yields to the temptation of trifling immediate attention and selling his birthright for a mess of poggage becomes himself an instrument of monopoly. That's a really powerful message. That is not a hundred percent stolen and <laughs> changed. <laughs> Poggage is good. Poggage is good. Hello, 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 hello. Uh, Gumzo, yo, can you thank my sub, Big A? It's been a while, bro. You didn't even sub. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, I'm not gonna, you didn't sub. What are we gonna think? What am I thinking? Um. Nearby alarm, think of the four months. Dead koala, think of the two months. Atrioc, people die four times as often scuba diving than in a helicopter. Is that true? I can't even fathom if that's true. You might have just made that up. I have no idea if that's based in fact. But also, like, how often do people die in helicopters? Other than Kobe, RIP, RIP the goat. Well, one of the greatest. <laughs> Uh, like I haven't heard of it happening. It's not like a common thing. And I feel, I feel pretty safe. It's, it's more than a hundred percent. That's what you think, Yeti? You think it's, you think I have a more than 100% chance of death if I were to scuba dive. That it's, it's got a, a 100% or more lethality, uh, mortality rate. <laughs> Nobody has ever scuba dived and survived is what you're trying to say. Wait, let me turn on the air. Bro, let me tell you, last night was a DVD. <laughs> last night was a fucking Pixar preview, dude. Last night was wild. And I it was a it was a fucking everyone who has ever scuba dived or still on scuba diving, I it's lethal, as what you've told me. Um as an Australian citizen, Australia isn't a real place. <laughs> what are you protecting, little bro? <laughs> what are you trying to keep us from figuring it out? Uh, uh, I'm glad, Fluidity, that you enjoyed the dating stream. I think the dating stream was pretty fun. Uh, hopefully, people won't be cringe about it because Rachel and Blur, you know, uh, are my friends. And they came on, and the vibes were good. And, you know, they were having a good time. And also, it takes a vulnerability from them to open up about that kind of stuff. It's generally pretty private. 
So hopefully you enjoyed. But after that, I went to the game with uh, with the boy with you know Mang Lud Shake uh, Yingo. We went to the Lakers game, which f f maybe first Lakers game I've been to in person since I became a born again die hard Lakers fan. <laughs> Since I moved to LA, all right, put down roots and decided that I am now fucking uh, a diehard day one. And the game was great. That was a really fun fucking game. I thought for sure they were going to lose in the last second. I thought when Giannis had the ball six seconds left, only needed to fucking drive, I think it would be over. Uh, but he did. They clutched it. And it was hype. We were pogging, you know, standing on our feet. Good times. Uh, did they get a, wait, wait, sorry, what? <laughs> Do you go hard in the paint? Um, I will say mango does. So when you go out drinking with mango, you have to drink way more than you normally would. I'm pretty, I'll admit that I'm a lightweight. Bro, when I drink, I'm straight up, I'm, I'm a lightweight. I, you know, I get a couple shots, one couple drinks. I'm good. But the second I get there, uh, to the bar outside the game, mango goes, Let's do two Jaeger bombs. And then so we <laughs> So we instantly do two. I haven't even eaten yet. I'm hungry as shit. And then we start getting these fucking gigantic beers. Um I can't drink. The taste of alcohol just ruins it for me. I mean, that's not a bad thing, I think. I think if you really have no temptation to drink because you just hate it, then it's like, okay, then you're never gonna be <laughs> that's good. <laughs> it's healthy. But like, uh, I got no problem doing shots. I I don't love beer, but I don't I have no problem doing shots. And so I was doing them, and I got drunk pretty fast because we hadn't eaten. So obviously, being the intelligent, uh, business-minded individual I I am, I decided to do a little bit of recon, and I went to the nearest Wetzel's Pretzels in the stadium and bought myself two fucking honking double deluxe pretzels, which is what I ate. <laughs> So I drank a bunch of beer, uh, kept doing shots, but I ate two fucking huge pretzels. So actually, it was really kind of the ultimate uh, experience. We saw LeBron. LeBron didn't even play, which is a little bit disappointing for me because, you know, you go to a Lakers game, uh, you want to see LeBron James play, but his ankles busted. So he just sat on the sidelines and laughed and made a meme, I guess. It's like two women, like <laughs> on International Women's Day. Just grabbing LeBron's arm and laughing at his jokes. I'm pretty sure he's married. <laughs> uh, you buy two pretzels or two franchises. What's the difference, bro? At the level I'm growing in the pretzel industry. Um, what's, what, <laughs> I heard you could beat LeBron one-on-one. -on -one. I could have yesterday. I absolutely could have beaten LeBron James yesterday. Dude was just sitting there. Um... That was the Lakers. Okay, later Lakers on him. Anyway, so we watched that. It was fun. Uh, Lakers clutch, which is like the exact thing you want when our Lakers game. We're all having a good time. We're all uh, fucking chilling. And then we went back to the warehouse for a night of debauchery drinking because everyone there wanted to practice for Birio Kart. And I thought that meant they were going to practice Mario Kart. But they didn't. <laughs> they just practiced drinking. <laughs> They barely even played Mario Kart, bro. They just drank. We all just sat around the warehouse drinking. They played some Mario Kart, but like not even the right rules. Um, yeah, so some people were practicing last night just by drinking. So, you know, we were just sitting around drinking, which is very fun, I guess, good time. And then, you know, as always seems to happen, I mean, it's like since I've first known him. Like if you go back to 2019 or something, maybe earlier? 2018? When did we first go to the melee tournaments? Like when I first met Lud, um, we end up in a corner of the venue playing fucking high stakes Fox Ditto money matches. <laughs> so, like, I'm thinking it's like 2 a.m. last night. Uh, we drank a whole fucking bunch. They stopped playing Mario Kart. And then we're sitting in a corner playing uh, $100 game Fox Dittos. Uh, on a melee, on a CRT in the corner. And we keep double or nothing until it's like $400 a game. Um, and when, 
Uh, whenever he loses, he starts screaming at me. And whenever I lose, I start smashing Aiden's desk. Oh, by the way, wait, I gotta say something. I have to say something and I, I hate to put him on blast. I hate to put him on blast. But we showed up at the warehouse late at night after the Lakers game. We showed up like, God, I wanna say, when did that game end? I, I, my, my sense of time is all off because my fucking computer clock only says 4.44 p.m. That is the only thing it says. Um, <laughs> so I, uh, so I, we get to the warehouse, we all show up, all right? Um, and we go inside and there's someone in there. <laughs> Again, no one should be there. It's like late at night on a Friday. There's no work being done. There's no sh shoot being done. There's nobody there. So I, I go inside and it's fucking Aiden sitting alone upstairs in the warehouse grinding melee by himself on Slippy and screaming in rage. <laughs> in the dark. It, he has a home. He has his own fucking place. He has, uh, you know, a setup to play at home. He's sitting there in the dark in this warehouse by himself playing melee and literally we all get there. Like, I'm like, oh, what up, Aiden? Give him a hug. You know, say, say what's going on. He sits down and he just starts fucking <laughs> just screaming. It's so funny. He's such a nice guy, but he rages so hard and he can't control it when there's company around. That's the thing. Most people can. Most people are ragers, but when people are around, they'll pretend like, oh, you know, I'm just having a good time. He can't control it. He actually rages really hard. What are you wearing? Paddock? Yeah, paddock on my wrist doing front flips, bro. This is a $480,000 watch. It's my daily driver. <laughs> uh, why is Melee ever so... I don't know. Melee is also my rage game. I, I If you haven't played Melee... Well, if you play it in person, I don't think people rage that much. And that's for many years. Oh, thank you for the sub. Uh, I slime pee and drink enforcer and huff a bow. Thank you for the subs. For many, many years, uh, I played Melee only in person. And I thought it was the greatest gentleman's game. You meet people. Everyone's nice in person. You shake hands. You say GG's. Uh, and then they added online play. And whenever I started to play online Melee, I've never raged hard. I, every opponent that beats me is scum of the earth. Every... <laughs> It makes me so mad. It makes me so... The game tilts me. Yeah, Ari can attest the only game I ever rage at is Melee. It's where I smash my desk. Um, I've broken three keyboards playing tic-tac-toe. Well, that just sounds like a... <laughs> sounds like a bigger problem. Uh, me with chess? Yeah, so people have told me it's like chess. People have told me chess. I don't rage at balloons. No, I don't rage at balloons. Don't even, don't even say it. I rage at my chat. <laughs> I rage at my chat during balloons, but I don't rage at balloons. Um, and I, I guess I did rage at League back in the day, but only in my peak of my addiction, where to me it was like an existential crisis. My whole ego was wrapped up in every point. Um, sounds like rage. No, I, I don't rage at chess. I don't think chess is, I don't think, I play chess usually on my phone on the toilet. <laughs> And I, I have not raged at it. It's not, I don't think chess is, um, I guess here's why I don't rage at chess. It is because I have never escaped a single narrow band of ELO points for five years. <laughs> I have been 1200 playing chess for five years. I found, if I ever win, I know for a fact I will lose till I go back down. And if I ever lose, I know for a fact I will win till I come back up. So there's no stakes for me. I, I don't feel any pressure. I'm not trying to get somewhere. Um, I am just a 1200 player. I, whenever I play chess, I'm not trying to improve. <laughs> I'm not trying to learn. I don't study my losses. I don't, um, I don't even look at the opponent half the time, bro. I just do my, I just do what I like to do. You know, I just do my plan. Um, I just try to, I try to get aggressive. I try to make a play on the king. If I don't get a checkmate, usually I'll fucking have lost the piece. And then they get me. It's just not a, 
That's why you suck. See, I don't think I suck. I think 1,200 is well above uh, average. What's the average? What's the percentage? What is the ELO percentage on chess.com? Uh, player rating percentiles. Okay, so if I'm 1,200, that means I'm in the top, what is, uh, 65%. Tell me top, top 34%, the opposite of that. The top 34%, that's great. <laughs> that's, I, have, I haven't tried once. I haven't studied once. I haven't done a lesson once. That's, that's all I wanna be. Whenever I, here's, here's the beautiful part. The beautiful part of where I'm at in chess is that if there's somebody casual, I pretty much always win. And if there's somebody that's good at it, I just say, you're a tryhard. <laughs> Do you understand? Like that's, I, I have the ultimate chess maxing. If I ever play a casual, I always win and I look good. And if I ever play somebody that's like really grinding at chess, I go, all right, lame. <laughs> and I like, I, it's a spot I like to be. I don't want to sit there and grind chess and then what? So I can invest it in myself and then I lose to a 1400 and I'm pissed. Mm. Uh, I'm, I'm at effort min maxing, exactly. So I really, I don't get salty at chess, but melee is different because I melee, I have a goal. And that's what Aiden was having a problem with. Aiden is like, he cares about every ranking point. That's what he said. He cares about every ranking point. And so like, if he wins one game and gets seven points and loses a game and loses nine points, he freaks out about that two point difference. He's sitting there on the computer, all his friends around whining, complaining. Oh, it's so unfair. It's so unfair. I lose, I win seven, I lose nine. <laughs> just like disgusted uh and so yeah i mean it's just it's it's the funniest aspect of his personality because if you met aiden like i don't know outside of gaming ever like if you met him at a coffee shop or in college or you would just think this guy's a well-adjusted normal nice guy really nice guy very Canadian, you know, just a good positive attitude. And then if you see him play melee, it's, it's just like hunched over in the dark, yelling at nobody. Um, unlike League, if you lose in melee, it's 100% on you. Well, I've learned over the years of playing many, many competitive 1v1 games that no matter how skill-based the game is, no matter how much it is your fault when you lose, people will invent a reason. <laughs> If you play StarCraft, you will notice that people, despite that game being, you know, one of the best balanced games of all time, 10 years of history, high level esports, uh, you know, a loss is definitely your fault. People would always blame, you know, oh, cheesy strategy. Oh, whatever race you're playing. Oh, Zerg, OP. Oh, Protoss, OP. Oh, Terran, OP. Um, they'll, they'll just always blame something. They... Uh, there's just no way they can take full responsibility. And that, that applies to chess too. People will say in chess, people will say, oh, you're just, you're a cheesy player. Oh, you brought your queen, fucking cheese. Oh, you're opening, so cheese. Um, that's why you always play a lower tier and have the excuse your character sucks. I hate this, I hate this. This is option select. If you guys don't play fighting games, uh, well, I'll just use it for Smash Bros example. You know, in Smash Bros, a character like Luigi is not very good. He's not a very good character. So if you play Luigi, you have what's called the low tier option select, which is if you lose, ah, Luigi sucks, not my fault. <laughs> and if you win, oh, I'm a god, I beat with Luigi? You're so trash. I played Luigi, you played a good character, I beat you. You're so trash. That's the, it's so annoying to play against because you as another player, cannot win. You can never feel good about your win and they will always option select you. Um, it's, a, it's a fucked up mental game that people will play to protect their ego. That's why I main Bishop in chess. <laughs> uh, don't lose. Did you not hear what I said? Did you not hear what I said? If you win, you don't get your satisfaction. That's the whole point. You win and they go, you just beat me because I'm Luigi. Your character's OP. So it's not about winning or losing, it's about you can never win. There's no way to win. Uh, <clears throat> who do you main this match? I main Sheik. Oh, speaking of that, uh, I did get invited to JMook's birthday party tonight. And so I don't know how late they're going, but I may dip out like 
nine forty five and go to Jamie's birthday party. That's possible. That's possible I will be doing that. I am trying to welcome him to LA. Uh oh, this was great. So there's a player in StarCraft One. StarCraft One, the most in-depth skill-based esport of all time incredibly 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 difficult pure 1v1 incredible mechanics break your hands strategic geniuses okay and the greatest player of all time was flash and uh undisputed the goat and when he was about to retire he had to retire because they were going to pull him into the korean military everyone's required all all korean men are required to do two years of military service so flash had to retire to go to the military and in his last season, before he retired, he showed up to tournaments and started playing random. <laughs> in StarCraft, you could only pick three races, Terran, Protoss, or Zerg, and they're all very different. And nobody in the 20 year history of StarCraft One tournaments ever played random. I mean, it was like, it, was, it wasn't a thing in any major tournaments. No one ever gone far with it. But they have a random option. And you know, I want to stress how incredible this is because you're playing against like if flash is playing against a good Zerg player, that guy has been playing nothing but Zerg for 15 years <laughs> since he was a child. He's been in a bunk bed grinding fucking Zerg. This guy only knows Zerg. And so flash would random something he would random Zerg and then beat this guy Zerg for Zerg. Like it's insane. It was insane. It was a level of skill that, it boggles the mind. Now, he didn't win that tournament. He actually got, I think, third. But it was still... I mean, he was beating some of the best players in the world with their own race, which was... It was crazy. It was it blew my mind. Um, what is Flash doing nowadays? Managing a McDonald's? No, he left the military, I think, recently, and now he's probably back to competing, if I had to guess. Um, although, I think he did do a crypto scheme. I don't want to. I don't want to put this juju on him if I'm not factual. But I, as I recall, he did do like a crypto thing on his fans back in like 21. I think he did like a. You guys got to check out this crypto. <laughs> he might have done that, and that would be that would be pretty fucked. But I I don't 100 percent know that's fact. Um. It's right. The chattest thing was boxer. Yeah. So there was the first, the first, I want to show you this guy. Uh, Im Yo Hwan. I met this guy uh, back when I was a big uh, Starcraft head. This guy, this guy, dude, he looks like a K-pop star. Look at this, Chad. Uh, this is boxer, Slayer's boxer. He was the first Korean Starcraft superstar. The first guy to get famous and like, be on TV, and he had a self-published autobiography that sold like 500,000 copies. He was like, you know, he's a, he's a fucking legend. Uh, he's the first amazing player. Uh, and he was so famous in Korea that when he was forced to retire to go to the military, the military let him make an Air Force StarCraft team <laughs> so he could keep playing. So like when he had to quit pro leagues, he went to the military and they made the Air Force Ace StarCraft team and he got to recruit other players and he made a five man team and they got to enter tournaments. It was it was incredible. And he would show up in like a flight suit to tournaments and play StarCraft. It's actually it was actually so fire. It's actually a, a um Did you watch T1 last night? No, I saw the highlights. They got fucking perma stomped. They got waxed into the ground. Um sadly, very sadly. Um but it's cool. I mean, I, I I should I want to do like a video on some of the StarCraft stories because I think of all the esports, StarCraft has some of the most incredible stories. The incredible legacies. It's so long running. It has like um, just some incredible finals, incredible players, incredible I don't know everything. And I I know it all because I that's what I came up in. So, but I don't really talk about it. I made one I think about Bisu, but um. Instruct, I have an anatomy exam soon. Do you have any knowledge you could teach me? No. <laughs> no, no, I have no idea. No. Uh, hi, Atriok. UK frog living here. I know living in UK is an L. Just caught your stream live. Okay, I got, we got to stop this right now. 
<laughs> I don't actually hate UK frogs. Okay? Can we stop this? I, I, I feel like every UK frog that mentions me is like, hey, I know that I live in... <laughs> I know I live in the UK. And that's terrible. I apologize. It's like, wait, it's not your fault, bro. I'm just saying... Uh, it's fun to make fun of. Okay? You guys had fucking three-fourths of the world at one point. And you fumbled the bags. <laughs> People want to talk shit. All right? There's like a nice global reason to talk shit. But not you. Um, do, 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 uh, Can you make chat back to normal size? I kind of like this. It shows more chats. I can make it a little bigger. But the thing about it when it's big is it cuts off shit, bro. Cuts off shit. I guess that's fine. No, it's too big. See, it's just too big. I, I kind of like it like this. I think I think that is better. Uh, <clears throat> are EU frogs below UK frogs or above UK frogs? No, you understand. We're American. We don't know the difference. <laughs> I'm pretty sure England is somewhere in the Mediterranean Sea. So they're all mushed together. Uh, it's all the same thing. It's all... Um... How often do you work out? I work out four times a week, but I am now realizing, this is actually a big, sad revelation for me, chat. My gym is basically like, <laughs> that's a bad word. I guess it's like CrossFit, in not in name, but like in spirit. I feel like I don't lift enough weights. Um... Uh... I'm just now realizing, so I'm working out regularly, I'm getting a sweat on, but what I'm realizing is I'm not like pushing myself. I'm not going up in my bench or squat or, do you know what I'm saying? Um, so I like my guy, I like my gym, I like that it's close, but I might try to branch out here in a bit. Uh, and also my guy, <laughs> my trainer, he, he is obsessed with Destiny 2. I know I've mentioned this before, but I don't think I've I don't think I've gotten across to you, chat, how obsessed he is. <laughs> it is the main topic of discussion during our workouts for 45 minutes of the hour, probably. <laughs> he has completely relapsed. He has completely relapsed. He has not. Like, he said he was off of it. He's not off of it. He's 100% relapsed. He he wants to tell me about the latest guns, about the latest raid, about people in his clan that don't give him enough respect. <laughs> he wants to tell me about how he's going to gear up his warlock and not his titan. He's going to tell me about how he hopes there's, like, a, a character customizer because he wants to you know, make his Titan a guy and his warlock a girl. <laughs> it's like, he tells me all this shit and I'm, you know, trying to lift something or I'm trying to climb a rope and I'm like, yeah, for sure. <laughs> um, so what I told him to do is play Helldivers and I think he's going to try it. I told him to play Helldivers because I figure if you got to wean somebody off Destiny, that's probably the ultimate game. That's the ultimate game to get someone off of Destiny. I feel like a lot of Destiny people are trying Helldivers. Um, man, I wish Destiny didn't suck. See, I don't know if it sucks. Does Destiny really suck? I feel like Destiny is good, but um, poorly updated. Uh, as I would say, like they I feel like they made a good addictive game, but but they don't do a good job with it. Uh. It's baseline good, but it ebbs and flows. Yeah, anyway. Well, I don't I don't want to play. I don't want to get hooked on it. Uh, after what he, he's told me. I mean, he's put in, you know, thousands of hours. He actually showed me his phone. <laughs> he's, he's got his like, tracker on there. Um, it's got thousands of hours on it. Uh, but it inspires me because he is older than me, more ripped than me by a lot. Like, he's in great shape. And he plays thousands of hours of Destiny. <laughs> so it's like... Bro, I have no excuse. 
I have no excuse, sir. There's literally no reason I can't do this. I have to follow your advice. Um, but I do think his advice is not making me much stronger. It's making me healthier. I feel like I got a lot of energy. Actually, I, I have been losing weight, chat. I'll tell you why, because these... Oh, I'm not trying to show off my underwear here, but like... These pants used to be tight. This shit used to be tight. Do you know what I'm saying? This shit used to be like all my all my shit's kind of loose, low key. I'm not doing a hog reveal. <laughs> obviously, obviously, I'm not going to do a fucking hog reveal. That's not on the menu. But I thought I would show you that I've lost some weight. That's it, bro. That's uh, hard to gain muscle in a calorie deficit, little bro. Don't call me little bro. All right, have a little class. Have a little respect, little bitch. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, all right, fine. Maybe you're right. I don't care, but I feel like I still could. And I don't, I don't think I have a big calorie deficit. I mean, I feel like I'm eating healthy and all right. Maybe I don't know. I don't, I don't, I don't track my macros or anything. I don't do anything of that shit. It's so boring. It's so boring. The worst part of trying to get fit is the food. On ironic, people think it's the gym. I posit to you, it's the food. The food is way more difficult, requires way more thinking and planning and math and bullshit. I actually think the working out's pretty fun. Uh, the food's a pain in the ass. Especially because I made a hard commit, a hard commit to do, this is, this is gonna sound super fucking, <laughs> it's gonna sound bad. This is gonna sound bad. I'm saying it ahead of time. All right, you can't get, you can't make fun of me. You can't call me out of touch. You can't call me a streamer. You can't do anything. I'm going to say I made a hard commit to only order food three times a week. <laughs> That's it, okay? Only three times in a whole week, okay? That's it. Am I a hero for this? I'm asking a question. Is that heroic of me? Does that make me some sort of divine beast fighting against the odds um perhaps i mean i don't I, I wouldn't say that i'm just saying that you know i hear it out there in the ether um and I'm not, <laughs> this is three times total okay this is like you know here's what generally happens okay here's what generally happens i'll tell you what happens uh i I have breakfast covered for myself. No problem. No need to order out. Lunch. Sorry. Ari will usually handle dinner, which leaves me to handle lunch for me and Ari. Now, <laughs> my go-to is like a peanut butter jelly sandwich. But if she doesn't want that or I don't want that, then I don't have like a deeper, I don't have a deeper bench. Do you know what I'm saying? Or a ham sandwich. I'll do some sort of sandwich. I'm a big sandwich guy. Or I'll do like a, a factor meal or something, okay? But what I, I don't have a deeper bench than this. So what I'll do on those days is I will order lunch for both of us and then it's covered. And now I've got her a meal. I've got her some Chipotle or something fucking, you know? And I've, I've now provided. I basically brought back a fucking elephant husk to the cave, okay? And I'm providing for the family. <laughs> uh... And husk, yeah, the husk of the skin, the most important part. <laughs> um, Chipotle's pretty healthy. Yeah, I don't think we're eating healthy. I don't think we're eating healthy. I, what I'm saying, I, ordering out, it's because I think it's just a big fucking waste of money, and and it's, and it's gotten more extreme. It, it's just stupid. I just think I, I my goal is to get it down to zero or just like one on special occasions because ordering out is just if you really look at it and you. I just, even from like a grind set POV, it's like I could have taken that $50, $60 and invested in something. I could have bought one share of something and that would have, that would grow in value. I, <laughs> that's literally what I think. I think about it. Yes. Yes. And I'm not kidding when I say 60 for two. Again, we're in LA, California, more expensive. I've ordered, you know, uh, Uber Eats in Arizona. It's different. But like if you order like, Chipotle for two, that's 50, 50, 60 bucks. Easy. Easy 50, 60 bucks. And it's like, damn, bro, why am I spending? That's 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 too much money. That's stupid. Um, 
Uh, and I'll confirm it. Let me confirm it right now, just so I'm not. I would like to. Sh I, I don't want to show my fucking everything, but I want to show a receipt. Let me show a fucking receipt, just so you know I'm not fucking. Let's find a recent Chipotle order. Oh my god! Oh, that was when Blur and Rachel were here. Okay. Here it is. Boom, boom. Two burrito bowls, two burrito bowls, and a water bottle. Forty-eight sixty-seven. <laughs> Damn, bro. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's crazy. That's ridiculous. It just doesn't... It doesn't fucking... Um, make sense. So I, my goal is to cut it down to nothing. To cut it off the list. Slice it. Dice it. Be done with it. All right? And then I would like to take that money and buy a share of something every every day and just keep adding to the pile, bro. I've been trying to build this pile. Um, just go to Chipotle instead of delivering. I mean, yeah, you could also do that, but uh, you know, I, what's crazy is I don't know how much that saves. Let's see. That would save, there's a $6 service fee. There's a five fifty cent driver benefits. 50 cent delivery fee. So we're up to fucking seven bucks added. Then there's a $6.78 tip. Because I tip nice. Okay. And what does that add up to? Fucking. $13.78? 13, 14 bucks? 14 bucks. So it's 14 more dollars to get in the car and drive there. Versus order. And yeah, sometimes I take that convenience. Um, also, Uber Eats increases the base price. Is that true? I feel like I've heard that, but is that true? Uber Eats just straight up like cashes up the base price. That's kind of fucked up. It's kind of sneaky. It's kind of fucking sneaky, bro. It's kind of sneaky. For Chipotle? Let me see. Like, for example, if I were to get a burrito bowl. See, I don't think, I don't know, though. Because if I look on the on the website right now, if I order a burrito bowl, it's 12 bucks. Which sounds fucking high. Because <laughs> my mind is still tuned to ASU Arizona prices from <laughs> 2013. But uh, I think that's normal. I'm pretty sure that's normal uh, Chipotle prices in California. Uh, burrito bowl. I think it's 12 bucks. I think if I go to Chipotle right now, it would be like a $12 burrito bowl. Maybe I'm crazy, but... Um, Lil bro, do you get guac and queso? No! No, dude, I do not get guac and queso. I'm a common working man. <laughs> I do not add guac nor queso, bro. I work in the coal mines. Like, everybody, I'm blue collar. You think I'm up there with the fucking... Hoity toity Elon Musk buying fucking guac and queso? No, dude. I have my burrito bowl fucking raw, basically. Um, shows hands. These are the, look at these, look at these rough hands. <laughs> uh, no, I actually don't add guac and queso. Um, but mostly because I don't really like it. I like guac in general, but not for, I don't put it on my bowl. You put guac on a bowl, I just feel like it. now it's a guac bowl. I order on Just Eat and the guy I picked the food up front asked me if I'm wasting money on purpose. <laughs> Wait, you ordered food, the guy delivered it and asked you if you're wasting money on purpose. That's crazy. So forward. Uh kind of based. That's kind of based. I mean, he's just trying, he's trying to look out for you. Uh and yet the answer is probably yes. I mean, I am fully aware now every time I do it. Like I probably wasn't as aware. Because I'll here, here's the thing. I'll be, I'm just gonna let you in on my fucking finances here. Uh 
my Uber Eats for the longest time was hooked up to my PayPal, which is where all of my content creation stuff goes, okay? And since I was, everything else was paid for out of my normal bank account, which is where like my salary would go, I never cared. I never thought about it as real money. It was like Chuck E. Cheese tokens, you know? But now I'm like trying to put it all together and I looked at it and I was like, damn, this is some fucking boy math because this is way too expensive. It's like, what, what a waste of fucking money. So that's why I'm cutting down. All right, I'm like cutting down. Right, I'm just trying to fucking, I'm trying to figure it out. Um, you could honestly cook lunch for you and Ari for five bucks. I mean, I do that with peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. <laughs> Or, or ham sandwiches, bro. You, um, that's I, I. I put a little. I put art into it. I put art into it. Um. Yo, a trizzy big vod guy, rarely here live. Thanks for making me seem smart. No problem, Sizzo. Oh, we got a lot to talk about today. We're going to watch some videos, too. I mean, today should be pretty fun. I'm actually pretty stoked for oh, something we got to do today. Though I do have to keep track of time, not on my phone, because this is fucking broken, to see if I'm going to this uh, birthday party. But, uh, yeah, I think I told everything. Last night, really fun. Uh, drinking, Mario Kart, Lakers. Oh, yeah. Uh, spoiler alert. So, Ludwig and I played for, I don't know, an hour plus of Melee. $100 money matches. I ended up plus 400 and he screamed <laughs> screamed and threw the controller down so that's uh that's fucking huge dude and that's actually extra huge for me because i lost fucking 300 to him at genesis betting on jmook so you know what that's eight chipotle orders baby that's eight chipotle orders think about it okay i'm funding it <laughs> Uh <laughs> Once DraftKings add melee you're fucked. It's actually it's actually a wise point. Do you know? I think it's very easy for me to um I mean I think it's just factual. I, I think I, I feel like I have to say it because I have an audience of people who are in like that 18 to 34 male range, mostly younger, who are like the prime target for gambling and gambling addiction. I feel like I have to say that it's bad, but like if Melee was on there, I would be way more tempted, way more tempted. Um, uh, Um, I lost over 60k and I'm 22 don't do it bro you guys should actually listen to this guy <laughs> this is real this shit's real bro like not a joke <laughs> I just I, 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 I low key think people should actually be careful with these gambling ads bro you, I mean you look at the data and it's just bad People are doing it more and more and more and more and more. The helplines keep getting more calls. It's bad, bro. You don't win. <laughs> mm. That makes me so mad because how the fuck do you have 60K to lose at 22? <laughs> maybe he won. Maybe he only had 100 bucks and he parlayed it up to 60K then lost it all. You know what I'm saying? Maybe it was a boom and a bust. Uh... Do you watch Veritasium on YouTube? I do, and I will tonight. I'm going to watch one of the two new Veritasium videos tonight. Hundo P, very excited, it should be fun. Um, is stream out of focus? Probably, my camera's never fucking set up right on this shite. Huh? Yeah, that's better, hopefully, maybe. Um, I don't know, it's fucking in focus enough. So yeah, so up 400, night was good, got too drunk. I haven't drank in a while, so it hit. Uh, okay, okay, here's the rest of the story. I forgot, I knew there's a part of this story. <laughs> so, okay, uh, after drinking, um, playing games all night, have a good time, I gotta go home. All right, I gotta get out of there. 
uh, drink a bunch of water, chill out for a bit, uh, get the Uber, go home, um, get home, get to bed, about to go to bed. It's probably, I don't know, maybe 2 a.m. No, not too late. About to go to bed. Decide I'll check the comments on the latest Big A clips. <laughs> check the comments on the latest Big A clips. Open it up. There's some fucking Germans who... Let me be careful with this. Let me be careful with this. Mm, I think are misrepresenting certain basic facts. <laughs> the Germans invaded, okay? Uh, and so instead of going to bed, I get all heated. <laughs> And I recheck all the shit I read before I said what I said, okay? Because I stand by it. And then I got one, I got multiple sources and confirmation. I got a fucking PowerPoint here of all the confirmation of everything I fucking said. And then I realized it's fucking 4 a.m. <laughs> I'm like, I'm like walking around, dude. I'm like pacing around my house at two in the morning. Or he's like, what were you pacing about last night? I couldn't even explain it. It's so embarrassing. Um... <laughs> Uh, cause yeah, you know, it was probably just one comment that pissed me off. Um, and so I'll talk about that today. Probably. I think I, I mean, I'll show the PowerPoint, um, and we'll watch a video. Uh, so, but then I go to bed at four. So then I woke up pretty fucking tired. Um, but I got a short nap today. And also I, I don't know. I feel like I've got more energy lately. I feel like I've been, you know, some things are trying to starting to hit. I feel like I'm a little bouncy, uh, but I was locked in last night. I was fucking locked in. Um, someone on the internet is wrong. You don't get it. All. That's exactly what it was. It was someone on the internet is wrong, but okay. Here's what it is. I'll explain it to you. I'll explain to you my theory and I want you to honestly listen to me and tell me if this, this jives with your experience. Okay. Honest. You can disagree if you want, but like, yeah, yeah, listen to me. Okay. So on the internet, when someone makes a claim in a video, we as lazy consumers of content, have developed a shortcut, which is that we listen to the claim, oh, that's interesting, and either during it or right after, we scroll down to the comments. And if there's a comment that goes, um, actually, and has a lot of text and maybe numbers in it, we go, oh, I guess it's not settled. I guess it's not, I don't know, but I can't trust it. We don't even read what the fucking yapper is saying. We just sort of, we use it as a, we use the comments as a shortcut and we use the length as like a shortcut of quality and we just sort of put it all together and we're like, ah, I guess it's, I guess it's not settled science. <laughs> and I think people have learned to hijack this mental shortcut by posting these big fucking yaps that are incorrect, that are not verified, that don't track back to real sources. <laughs> but they use these fucking shortcut phrases to try and imply they have more knowledge on something than they do. And it it's it triggers me, bro. It pisses me off. Um it's it's misinformation spreading. Um and uh have you said this before? I'm not sure I said this before, but I this is just something I really deeply believe. I feel like we as a society we're like um I don't know, like animals that developed a shortcut in the wild and now a predator has evolved to take advantage of that shortcut. <laughs> <laughs> it's like uh you know it, um if gazelles fucking <laughs> I don't know always started drinking water at night so they wouldn't get hunted and so now a new predator has evolved that fucking hunts at night and that is what that is what these comments are um mm. Surely of a big screen text. Yeah, and then they use this 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 thing of big screen text. My grand anyway, so I'm gonna talk about it later. I'll talk about it in a bit. But it it was uh I I what I want to say is uh actually I'll, I'll talk about it later. I'll explain it later. Um it's rock. my dad gave me his stock trading account. What'd you do? Uh six years ago, and he was down bad on biotech stocks. Okay. Well, usually people say down bad, they mean they're like horny. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Down bad is taken on a meaning of like sexual interest. 
I don't know if your dad was down bad on biotech stock. I don't think he wanted to fuck. Like, I don't know. <laughs> Uh, Genetech or something. I, <laughs> I feel like he wanted to. Um, I you. Okay, I'm sorry. Your dad gave you his stock trading account. He was down, lost money on biotech stocks. You took all of his money and bet it on Tesla. Okay. And, <laughs> I'm sorry. Wait, what? <laughs> you bet it all on Tesla on margin. That means debt. That means he he took he borrowed money to bet more. Uh, thank God I didn't do options up bigly. So my dad thinks I'm a genius now, but I'm a dummy. I mean, I do. I I'm happy that it worked out. Uh, buying Tesla six years ago, great investment. Still holding it. Less so. I mean, if you just sold in the 21 peak or whatever, you would have made a lot more. I think it's down quite a bit. I think Tesla fell out of the top 15 today. Uh, no, no, it's 14. Top 10, fell out of the top fucking 12 recently past Nova. Um, uh, but yes, good call. So you're good. What I would tell you is like investing on margin, always stupid. Always, 100% of the time. For a retail, for a regular person, investing on margin is always stupid because it charges you a fee. So you have to not only beat <laughs> the market, you have to beat the fee. It's just not a good idea. Please don't borrow money to make stock bets. Then you will... <laughs> you will be doubly sad because it's money you don't have. Um, or you can do what Seymour Butt says. Famed financial advisor, Warren Buffett often says that he took his advice from Seymour Butts 21, which is that if you make a big bet on Robinhood on margin and then they're like, hey, you owe money, just delete the app. <laughs> Fucking easy. Just delete the app. How can they, what can they do? <laughs> Uh-oh, it's gone, idiot. It's off the phone. Um... <laughs> uh, how do you sell stocks when they are up my nvidia is 300 percent up but i don't want to sell all uh man it depends because i can't give you any advice because i'm still holding <laughs> i i i told i'm almost doing it for the fun of it because i think if nvidia passes apple which it might it would be the funniest stupidest, most bubbly, insane thing. If NVIDIA passes Apple in 2024, that's just not, that's so unreasonable that I will have to sell. And they're close, like, they're, I don't know, they're pretty close. And so that's sort of my my trigger <laughs> if I were to do it. But like, I don't know, I'm not, I'm not pressed about it. I'm not trying to fight for, uh, um, you know, I'm good. Um, Dude, dude, you were saying that Diamond Hands is a scam? It is. Diamond Hands is 100% percent I'm not get, I'm not telling you Diamond Hands. I, what I'm saying to you, B Mego, is if being up 300% will materially impact your life, if it's good enough to screenshot, it's good enough to sell, bro. Sell that shit. Sell that shit. Take your dub. Uh, No one feels bad about tripling their money, bro. I, you shouldn't be mad. That's great. Uh... Do you have any bets for the Oscars? I don't really. What I I I would love to tell you that I do, but I don't. Um, do you want to send me the form? I could take a look, but I just don't. I'm not sure that I have any calls on. I don't even know what I I, I liked holdovers. That's like the best movie I've seen this year. Is holdovers. Um. Over under on Atrioc winning one Oscar. I could do it. My performance in the Papathon? You think? Uh, you think I won't get a Oppenheimer sweep? Uh, probably. It was great. I liked Oppenheimer a lot. It will probably do really well. I'm sure Barbie will win some awards. I'm sure Oppenheimer will win some awards. Um, Ricky Stanicki sweep. <laughs> Can you imagine if Best Picture goes to Ricky Stanicki? And John Cena gets up there in character. Uh, I have not seen Dune yet. Stop asking me, bro. I'll see it when I see it, and I will talk talk about it. Um, 
Hey, Shrug Sweater is sick. Is that March we can buy? I don't think I'm going to sell uh, merch until June, and I don't know what it's going to be. Except for Enron hats will come back, but I don't know about anything else. I don't know about these. Um, did you see the Blackberry movie? I watched it on a plane. I fucking loved the Blackberry movie. I loved it. I thought uh, Glenn Howerton, a.k.a. Dennis from Always Sunny, was amazing. Uh, <laughs> I'm from Waterloo, where the vampires are. <laughs> uh, yeah, he was fucking great. Uh, yeah, it was great. It was just fucking, it was awesome. It was a really, really fun, interesting story. And some stuff that I didn't know, um, which is cool. It's a cool business story. Uh, yeah, I saw Air, Tetris, and Blackberry. I think they're all they're all pretty fun. I think Air was a little bit mid I not that I didn't like it. I liked it when I got out of it, but like it's kind of been forget. I think they could have done more with it. But and then I saw Tetris. Tetris, I heard they took a lot of liberties. They changed a lot of real stuff. But the true story is so interesting that I that I still learn from it. Um watched Flubber earlier today. Can you tell me about that? <laughs> What drives a man to sit down in the middle of the day and watch Flubber in 2024? I'm not saying it's a bad movie, but I am saying it's a kid's movie. The Flub. <laughs> I mean, was there any reason? Was there, you just thought, um, feeling flubbish? Does a man need an excuse to experience cinema? <laughs> Sometimes you got to flub. If you guys don't know, I feel like Zoomers don't know about Flubber. Can I be real? It's 1997. I love you with all my heart, with every molecule, every atom. I love you on a subatomic level. This is going to be the very last time I try to marry you. I'd rather die than disappoint you. On the most important day of his life, Philip Brainerd, the world's most absent-minded professor, made a few little mistakes. Wow, what a bang. And one gigantic flub. <laughs> Flubber. Flubber? Sounds like baby shampoo. It's a metastable compound. If you apply a small amount of energy... It liberates an enormous quantity of energy. So it's like this really bouncy green goo. And that alone would be a weird concept for a movie. But then it's like, <laughs> it's like sentient. <laughs> and it starts dancing. <laughs> Destiny has applications in the field of sports. Oh, oh, when I exit this window, the flubber will send me right back up unharmed. Are you nuts? Ta-ta, my love. <laughs> Ouch. Walt Disney Pictures presents... Oh. A classic story. Mayday! Oh, sorry. First time flyer. A boy meets Goo. Get him! This Thanksgiving... What? <laughs> Discover the stuff that dreams are made of. <laughs> Nothing in the rules says a flubber can't play basketball. It's so true. Anyway, what just happens in this? That's it. I mean, he just gets into hijinks because he has a really bouncy flubber, but the flubber can also think and talk. Not talk, just act. <laughs> Which causes all sorts of issues. That's the movie. Anyway, I just, uh, I haven't seen it in fucking 20 years, so I'm going off of vague recollections, but um, did Flubber win the Oscar? It actually was a sweep. Flubber actually cooked the Oscars that year. It won Best Screenplay, Best Picture, Best Actor for Flubber, Best Supporting Actor for Flubber when it splits off and does the dance. Um... It won Best Sentient Goo. 
Uh, have you seen all of the incidents of Boeing planes being just screwed? Yeah, yeah, I have. <laughs> yeah, I've talked about it. Uh, I actually did a, a Marketing Monday segment on Boeing and how um, they basically have removed all of the engineers from their leadership over the course of decades, become purely financialized, uh, you know, with Wall Street type managers that have been managing to quarter after quarter guidelines. Uh, like, you know, uh, earnings expectations. And so they stopped caring about making good shit. I mean, they've, um, yeah, the the quality control's gotten terrible. They outsourced a bunch of shit to like, I think it was India I mentioned in the video. Um, you know, they used to have the safety engineers have to get in a test plane <laughs> and fly it. Like they would all have to be in the plane as it fly, like to do a test pilot. Indonesia, it was Indonesia. And so... Like, if you know you're gonna have to fly the test, or be in the plane when the test flies, you will make sure that the software is fucking good. You will you'll check and double check and triple check. But if you outsource it to Indonesia for the cheapest possible, then no one cares. Um, and so, you know, Boeing has just been a real uh, letdown for American engineering and, you know, American uh, manufacturing and all that. It's bad. Uh, and has been a huge gain for the European uh, plane manufacturer, Airbus. Um, if Boeing is doing that, probably all of them are doing it. Well, I don't think Airbus is, that's the whole point. There, there's like quality control differences. Um, I don't want to fly on a bus. I want to fly on a plane. <laughs> American. I don't want an air bus. I want an airplane, Europe. I'm never going to buy your shit. Okay? Uh, where are we dropping? <laughs> Did Airbus make the battle bus? We can only wish. God, we can only hope. Um, actually, we can only pray that it wasn't because I would hate for the battle bus to be European made. Why doesn't China have a plane bread? I believe they do. I believe they do and are trying to get it bigger. Uh, Comac. That's what it is. Comac. What does it stand for? Um, Comac stands for Commercial Aircraft Corporation of China. <laughs> That's what it is. Comac, baby. Uh, yeah, that is their, they are attempting to, but uh, the U.S. has sanctioned it to prevent, you know, um, Chinese airplanes from getting uh, a big market. <laughs> uh, you know, because if Boeing fucking sucks and if Airbus slips, then the world would all be flying on Chinese planes which the U.S. doesn't want. Um, I can't wait till they start trying to make AI planes. You can't wait for that. You are excited for a world where um, there's a self-driving AI plane. <clears throat> Might be late, but thoughts on due to? I haven't seen it yet. I haven't seen it yet, bro. I mean, I guess, you know, wait, I will say like long, long term, of course I would like self-driving almost everything. You got to imagine eliminating human error will lead to fewer mistakes, deaths, disasters, especially because you can always have a pilot there. Um, I, I, actually, my understanding is that pilots now, a lot of it is autopilot. They just have to be there in case things go wrong. Like a lot of it is autopilot. Um, and so, <clears throat> yeah. Um, I mean, again, I've always said, my dream is to get into a car that has no steering wheel. It's basically like the minority report cars. Uh Yeah, these fucking cars, bro. Uh, well, I don't know. Like this one. 
There's a perfect example. Well, it's fucking not loading. There, there we go. Like this. It's just got four seats, plenty of leg room, and you can set it up to take a nap. Oh, God, dude. This is beautiful. What you want is a train? No, bro. This is America. <laughs> okay, please. I don't want public transport, okay? I want everything to be about cars. Uh... Get it through your head. It sounds great until the government decides you have the wrong opinion and the car drives you to the re-education camp. <laughs> okay, that's a bit of a slippery slope argument there. That if we ever get self-driving, we are going to be all fucking driven to camps. Um, it also is funny to imply that like... <laughs> so there's a world where our government sets up massive re-education camps all over America. But you can escape because you have your trusty Ford F-150. <laughs> the military and the police can't get you and take you there. Because you can escape on your non-self-driving car. And I just, I I think that's super sick. But I think more realistically, we as a society should try to just make sure we don't get re-education camp society. Then try to keep our cars safe from <laughs> driving us there. Um, me avoiding the camps in my gay little 2009 Subaru Outback. <laughs> Don't call it gay. <laughs> Derogatory. <laughs> Don't call I'm, I'm assuming that you are saying that from a place you can. Uh, HR, did you hear about the guy who tried to steal a driverless Waymo car in downtown LA, but there was no way to actually drive it? So what did he do? Wait. There was no way to actually drive it. So he just sat there trying to drive it till he got arrested. <laughs> That's funny. I know there was that funny clip of a cop trying to pull over a driverless car for speeding, but like he didn't know what to do. Like he pulls it over and there's no driver there. He doesn't know who to talk to or what to... It's. I think that's interesting. Um, yeah, I think the car just starts leaving, right? It just starts driving away. Mm. <clears throat> do you think if you had a self-driving car, you would still order Uber Eats? Well, I mean, if there was like mass adoption of self-driving cars, the cost of Uber Eats should go way down. Theoretically. Um, theoretically. So maybe I would, but at current prices, no, obviously not. Um, couldn't you just send your car to Chipotle? Yeah, yeah, but then, <laughs> wow, they're just gonna toss it in there, I guess. Maybe. I mean, they probably set something up. Uh, Self-driving cars would change. I'm just saying it would be sick. <clears throat> I'm just saying it would be sick. Obviously, number one would be real public transport. I think, like, big fucking cross-country high-speed rail. But I, I can't even hope to dream of it, <laughs> you know? But I can dream of them selling me a fucking self-driving car. <laughs> Do you know what I'm saying? Like, I can, I can see that happening. I just don't... I don't think they're gonna... Um... What if we went back to 2005 level inflation? Would Chipotle prices go down? No. No. Uh, no. <laughs> we have the, inflation is always prices going up. Always. So in 2005, it was probably 2%. Probably a normal inflation rate. So that means prices would go up 2% a year. But when it goes up 2% a year, which is the government's goal, people don't really notice. It's small enough, they don't really notice, and <clears throat> it's considered by them to be better to err on the side of being a little bit of inflation than being a little bit of um, deflation, which is prices going down. And you might think, what the fuck? I want prices to go down. But the problem is, if prices go down 2% every year, then people have an incentive to not buy things. They're like, wait, I'll just wait. It'll be cheaper later. Things are always getting cheaper, I'll just wait. And then they don't 
buy things and the economy slows down, yada, yada, yada. That's the idea. So that's what they want, keep it at 2%. <laughs> now, if you look at the history of that number, they actually kind of pulled it out of their ass. I mean, 2% was just chosen one time. I think it was one European country, Central Bank, said, we're going for 2% target. And then everyone just kind of ran with it, and it's been like the thing. It's not like a fucking scientific number. The dream would be zero. The real dream, if, if governments could actually do it, would be sound money, 0% inflation. Your money is your money. It buys the same. Uh, prices of things would go up as they get more expensive to make and go down as they overall get cheaper and technology gets better. That would be awesome. But uh, they can't do that, so they, they aim for 2%. Um, so yeah, if we were to go back to 2005, it would just be growing growing slightly slower. Uh, yeah. 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 <clears throat> um. Watch. Why is 0% not possible? Um, it's just a very, very difficult moving target to hit. Um, there's so many things that go into prices that it will be tough for the government to ever try to hit 0% inflation. Um, <clears throat> especially when we run fucking deficits to print money. Um, so they just aim for 2%. 2% is like the goal. Uh, it's Shrock. I'm watching Tokyo Vice. Good. Um, uh, great video about corrupt politicians. Uh, well, I want to watch. Uh, I want to watch some. Are you watching Shogun? Yes. Though I haven't seen episode three. No spoilies. We do Sunday Shogun. Um. If you could change one thing in the history of finance, what would it be? I mean, if I'm being dead honest, I don't know if it would actually change anything long term, but I would have had Ronald Reagan decide never to go into politics. <laughs> or, um, I don't know. There's this, there's this story I heard, okay? Um, and you can tell me if it's a little incorrect. I'm not, this is a little bit off memory. Um, in Sweden, there was a king, this was way back in the day, who was very, very ostentatious. He was very profligate spender with his money. And he built this giant fucking ship, this mat, one of the biggest ships ever in the bay of the city, like where all the people of the city could see it, okay? The ship was so big that on the day it was set to sail, it keeled over. <laughs> it like fucking broke and fell into the harbor and it was, and like you could still see maybe the mast sticking out or whatever. It was a disaster, okay? It's a, it was a disaster. It's a huge monumental public failure. Uh, <clears throat> this becomes part of the lore of the people of the country where they sort of, get a generalized societal wide attitude that like getting too big for your britches with money and spending and is bad. And it's better to like, you know, <laughs> I don't know, not try to flex so much. Okay. You understand that? And that thing has positive effects years, decades later, centuries later on laws, on, on attitudes, on, um, equality in the country. You know what I'm saying? I think I wish that Ronald Reagan or yeah, probably Reagan <laughs> when he tried to cut taxes on the wealthy at the same time as he was trying to do it and do trickle down economics, he slipped and fell on a banana peel into a huge pile of manure. <laughs> I wish it was broadcast on national TV and then right as he was saying this is a good idea, he tripped and he fell and he ate shit literally and everyone laughed and laughed and laughed and he lost all of his votes and it was a disaster and he got super flamed and all of his opponents got way more votes and I wish that happened and it like was a lasting memory and it was caught in fucking HD for the first time and, and people play the clip a million times. 
I wish that was part of our social fabric, that we think of that as a shitty idea and that he was a shitty person for suggesting it. But instead, he was widely celebrated and because um, often stupid finance decisions are short-term benefit, like short-term positive, but long-term shitty. So a president can make a decision that's like bad for the country long-term, but during his presidency leads to like more spending and uh, growth and, you know, <clears throat> so he does that and the 80s are like boom years and everyone loves him and they look back on him so fondly. And actually he was really fucking dumb. Um, so that's my, that's my, if I had to change one thing, it would be that that went really poorly for him and we all remembered it. What exactly did he do as dumb? He broke the back of all unions in America, uh, removing, uh, that third voice between government, uh, corporations and labor. He just got rid of labor. He cut taxes dramatically on rich people and corporations with the idea that the money would trickle down into new jobs and other people. But instead, all it led to was an ever-increasing wealth gap because the rich who are ahead got more and more ahead. Uh, those are the main things. He also cut a lot of social services, a lot of you know, uh, government mental health programs, things that like had a good social safety net for America so people could like get back on their feet when they stumble. He cut all that shit, all right? So I think he was very bad for the country, but in ways that weren't apparent Tell later. Um, uh, trickle down economics is so funny because it really does sound like the rich are pissing on you. <laughs> like that's what it literally is. And also it sounds like that. It's like very aptly named. Uh, wait, let me get a water and play Vod Frog. One second. Anyone else feeling the existential, existential dread of politics, realizing we can't actually do anything on an individual level? Bro, just smoke weed, oh, bro. <laughs> uh, I know this is a popular vibe. It makes me on, I don't wanna say annoyed because you're being genuine, but it, it's annoying to me because the, like, the, the implication is like, hey, HRock, shut up about anything real. <laughs> Like, the vibe I get when I hear that is like, hey, don't talk about real shit because, like, the real world's too scary and it makes me sad and, like, I just don't want to hear it. And it's like, bro, I like talking about this stuff. Um, I think there's a way to learn about the real world and not, like, constantly be dreading or existential dread. I think, you know, information, knowledge is power, bro. Uh, the real world, some real shit on God. Facts, baby. Fucking facts. Uh. <laughs> Would you say Twitch plays Pokemon or Ninja Drake had a bigger impact on Twitch as a whole? I can talk about this as an employee who was there for both of these events. Twitch plays Pokemon was my very first week at Twitch. It was fucking awesome. I was 21 years old, maybe 22. Oh, hold on, I started. Whatever. The point is, I was, I was my, it's my first fucking thing. Uh, first week. I get the job. We go up to a fucking... My boss's cabin in Tahoe. It was like they already planned this for a while. It was the marketing team retreat. 
and I'm not even on the team yet, bro. <laughs> the first thing I get to do is go on vacation with the team, and I don't even I haven't even worked a day in my life yet. Um, we go up to Tahoe, but the second we get there, Twitch Plays Pokemon starts popping off, and all of a sudden we have to work. <laughs> So we're setting up laptops instead of like going out and doing things. And we're all like watching this like every second. And we're like, you know, you got to write press releases. You got to fucking uh, contact people in the news. You got to fucking uh, promote it. There's social media stuff. There's got to, you know, you're trying to like, because it was like the first big event of Twitch's history. It was like the first thing that got people to like talk about Twitch in the news and come check it out. The stream was the biggest stream we'd ever had. And it was huge. I think it was really big for getting Twitch off the ground among gamers. 100%. But that being said, so was Ninja Drake. You flash forward, you know, I think it's probably four years. Twitch is pretty established. Twitch is big. Twitch is doing well. But it's not growing. It's actually pretty flat. And there's a lot of pressure from Amazon to be like, fucking grow already. You guys lose money and you don't grow? We didn't pay a billion dollars for a company that's not growing and doesn't make money. Like, Amazon's pissed, right? And so Twitch is flat. Like it's gotten this chunk of gamers. It's leading in the gamer space, but it hasn't, you know, it's flat growth. And so right then, out of the blue, the sky parts, the clouds open up and comes Fortnite and Ninja. <laughs> Specifically Ninja with Drake. They get 600K views, which is like a massive record at the time and brings in all these normies. I wouldn't say it's just that one stream though. I mean, I think it's like the whole Fortnite wave. Fortnite saved Twitch for a whole year and a half. Like it just, the growth was crazy. The, yeah. So, um, yeah, that's what I'll say. I'll say probably Fortnite Drake, Ninja Drake, but barely. Um, how do these two compare to COVID? Yeah, COVID's the same thing. So again, so Fortnite boom happens. Twitch is like, yes, we're safe. Amazon's off our back. <laughs> And then it starts to level out, and then the growth is flat, and it's like, oh, fuck. We need something. And then there's a global pandemic. <laughs> and then the numbers go stratospheric. Like, Twitch Twitch leadership has gotten bailed out. I mean, you know, Emmett Shear got bailed out by, like, three or four things that kept making him survive when he would have gotten kicked out by Amazon. He might have eaten that bat, is all I'm saying. What if there isn't something for a while? That's happening right now. So now there's post pandemic and now Twitch is flat growth again. <laughs> but you know, based on history, something will happen. Something will happen and it'll make Twitch grow again. I don't know what it'll be. Um, it's up to you. It's up to Emmett, dude. Emmett's out there eating another bat. Uh, maybe it'll be Ligma. <laughs> maybe it'll be Ligma. Um, is Kai an industry plant? No. No. Uh, <laughs> no. He, wink. <laughs> no, I'm kidding. He's not. <laughs> he is probably just the most energetic streamer. I think all of the big streamers now, Kai, Jinxie, and Queso, are like 10 times more energetic than everybody else. So that's what people want. They're just, they're just more, they're they're giving you more, dude. Um, yeah, XUC is the blueprint, but they took it farther. Speed, speed, but speed's on YouTube. Speed's, speed's on, on Twitch. Um, do, 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 do. I know people say loud funny. Uh, yeah, maybe maybe that's part of it. It's definitely like a younger thing. But like there's something to be said. Like I I think Jinxie does do loud funny, but he also does, you know, consistent schedule every day, new content, mixes it up, carry the whole game on his back, is actually good at the game. Like I think people have I think they've got I, I, you can't write a lot of people can be loud. <laughs> I don't think a lot of people get their success. So I think I think they're pretty good at their jobs. I think they're um, I think they're pretty good at what they do. I think I mean listen, you guys watch when that when I hired the actor for this stream. This is for my stream. 
Yeah, I think I got some energy. I think, I, you know, I'm, I'm animated when I talk. I'm passionate about what I talk about, but I'm not, I'm not fucking Kai or Jinxie, right? And so I hired that actor to play me and he was the most, he was low energy, bro. <laughs> and he told me it was like really fucking hard. All I'll tell you is that it's harder than you think. You get on, you know, you, it's harder than you think. Um, and the only reason I do it is because I feel like I, I like what I'm talking about, so I get into it. I don't even notice that I'm doing it, but like, um, I think it's harder than you think. And I think that's why like someone like Kai, I think is impressive. I think it's like to have all that shit and all that energy and have so many fucking things set up and you're doing, it's like, it's, you, you gotta, you gotta live it. It has to be your hundred percent of your life. You can't like have a fucking, you can't go read a book. <laughs> You know what I'm saying? There's no part of your day where you're just going to go read a book and like that can be your, you just can't do it. It's not possible. Um, uh, but the paycheck is surely worth it. Oh yeah, they're making generational wealth. So, uh, you know, fine. And some of it's luck. We all got to say that. Some of it's luck. But I think it's a little bit less than people think for those guys. Because um, I don't think there's like a competitor who's doing the same quality thing, but with less views. Um, cocaine would be a performance enhancing drug for streaming. Don't, <laughs> don't say that. Trickle-down economics seems to ignore the core tenet of greediness in economics. Do people just not think of that at the time? Uh, I'm, the argument sounds simple, right? If you, if, if, let's say it hasn't happened before. We haven't proven that it doesn't work. <laughs> Someone says, hey, this rich guy, he made a factory and hired thousands of people. He made a lot of jobs, okay? But the government, the government keeps taxing him at high rates. They're taking his money to give it to welfare queens, what they would say. He's, they're taking their money to give it to you know, to spend on stupid shit, stuff you don't like. And then you're like, wow, I don't want that. Now, if you were to give him back that money and don't tax him, he'll probably open another factory and he'll hire a thousand more people and the economy will be great. You understand? You say it like that, suddenly it sounds like, when you take the angle of like, here's something in the government that you don't like, they're spending your money on that. Like, why, why should they be taxing? Even though they're not, they're, talking, they're not talking about your taxes, they're talking about exactly what's being spent. Um, that's how they work. Do you understand? That's how they market it. And it sounds good. When you're a regular person, you're like, wait a minute, that, that all checks out. And so you buy it, you fall for it, and then you end up noticing the rich get more and more and more and more ahead. The gap gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And the promised trickle down didn't come. <laughs> they just kept it. They used it to buy more assets. They just, they acquired more wealth. They bought your house from under you and then appreciated value. It's just not... It doesn't work out the way they promise. The only limiter, the only drag effect, you know, like, um, you know, it's like a snowball rolling downhill. Like wealth begets more wealth. It just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And the only thing that slows that down or drags it or keeps it from getting out of control is taxes. That's the only thing. I don't even care. Like, I am a, a proponent of taxes even if the money was burned. <laughs> I don't need the government to even prove that it's spending on something good. That would be nice. That's my dream. But even if they took the money and burned it, all it does is just keep the game a little more fair. It just keeps the game so that somebody with a better idea can like leapfrog a rich person. And it like the, 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 the snowball gets out of control if there's no drag on it. Um, now, thankfully, in the real world, most of it's spent on people do approve. They want it. People want social security. They want fucking um, health care. They want all that stuff. We just got, you know, you got to spend it better. But uh, they want roads. They want firemen. They want police. They want uh, they want military of some sort. But we spend too much, but we want military of some sort. Uh, we want intelligence. We want, you know, all that stuff. So, um, do, 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 do. watch some videos, little bro. Oh, I was watching a video. Let's watch a video, all right? I know I've been yapping, 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 although I do love to yap. L2Y, you know what I'm saying? Live to yap, that's my fucking tattoo I got on my back. Uh, let's see what a good video would be. 
We just launched our new. What about? Whoa, a new Mr. Beast, and it's about marketing. We just launched our. One dollar versus ten thousand dollar commercial. Jimmy Beast. I'm gonna watch this. Let's see if we can rate these different dollar value commercials. I'm actually kind of interested. Uh, I will say ahead of time, I am uh, not going to eat one of these bars. <laughs> I'm not a chocolate guy in general, but I am impressed by how Jimmy Beast here has taken on a 100-year chocolate monopoly by leapfrogging them in social media and uh, mass media tactics. He's kind of running circles around them and... It's impressive. Like this, the church has been touched by nobody for so long and he's making a move. And that's cool. That's like a sign of the times changing. The, the, the power of online content and like permissionless scaling and YouTube is like incredible. It's like, it's gonna let people do this and shit that was previously untouchable will get, will get broken up. Uh, and it's also incredible that he has gotten to the point where he can make a video that is an ad for his own product. <laughs> and that's the video. You know, normally it's like, there's the video, there's the ad in the middle and you skip it. He turned the whole video into an ad and it got, you know, 4 million views in 11 hours. That's crazy. He's getting paid to make a giant commercial people want to watch. That's, that's so rare in human history someone's gotten this. Um, so I want to see it. I want to learn about it. I feel like I'd be foolish on learning about this. A new Feastable Bar, which is new branding and all new formula. It tastes amazing. I like it. And to celebrate, I paid a bunch of people to make commercials for it, ranging from $1 all the way up to $10,000. And we're going to see if more money equals a better commercial. Starting with this $1 commercial. So, okay. It's just uh, a person moving it. <laughs> They're filming you get, you their computer monitor. This is clearly a joke. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is that? Why wouldn't you just record on your screen? But this is probably their way of saying, screw you, for only paying a dollar? Yeah, I All right, I'll say ahead of time, I don't love the editing. <laughs> I'll say ahead of time, I get it's for a different, younger audience. I don't love the editing. I also don't love this first commercial. Can't imagine anybody would give you any care for a dollar. I mean, to be honest, for a dollar, this is actually a lot of effort. Oh, it's over. That was awesome. Now, if I ran that as an ad during the Super Bowl. No. So far, you get what you pay for. That sucked. Now, let's jump over to the $50 commercial. Now okay. it's gonna get better. Well, as long as they don't start drawing it. <laughs> what is this? At least they're not recording with a phone this time, though. But there's no music. What do you want at, from these people? Price, $50. At what price point do we get sound with our commercial? It's getting better. <laughs> well, it ended abruptly, okay. That Didn't really get to look at it, did we? Yeah. Okay. Sure. That was 50 bucks? That's a really, that doesn't seem good. <laughs> Didn't really get to look at it, did we? Yeah. Okay. That's just a, that's a drawing. Surely the $100 commercial has audio. Oh, it does. Matthew, no junk food. We need to start eating better. What? <laughs> Who made this? So just follow me and I'll lead you right to- Quack, are you still here? Whenever I laugh or do my trademark HR giggle, can you put, can you do this editing? I feel like it would really add to our retention. Can I go, <laughs> and then you, you make the lips really big. And I feel like if you don't do that, you're not doing a good job in 2024. Mr. Beast is ahead of the game. What? Who made this? Yeah, that goes Just follow well. me and I'll lead you right to the healthier snacks. What is going on? This makes me really uncomfortable and I don't yeah. know why. I love this. I'm in pain. I love it. Way too many words. I haven't listened to anything they've said. What are you doing in the candy section? Looking at candy. Get to the point. Just look at these. <laughs> sea salt. He's nuts. These aren't even the new this ones. The whole point of the commercial is our new bars. <laughs> you suck. This is what it looks like now. This is what it looks like now. Yes. Surely the $10,000 commercial will be better. Let's see the $500 one. All right, $500. Vegetables. Don't mind if I do. <laughs> oh, I'm, I'm down. I love it. Ooh. That was a cool effect. I like that. Ooh, the hand. <laughs> so they're... <laughs> They're sentient. This is the best thing that's ever <laughs> been created. That one? That's pretty good. I mean, imagine you're flipping on TikTok and then you see someone just go, Feastables. That's when you- ah! After watching that commercial, do you want to eat this amazing chocolate? Yes. Why, well, yes I do. Nice to have a Feastable. I'd love to share a piece with you. I love jingles. <laughs> it's really the least that I can do. This is fire. Mr. Beast has made a treat. 
for me. And you. Yeah. How much do you think this cost if I cut out the $10,000 one? Like all in, you think I could get 10 commercials at different price points for $5,000? What's your honest opinion on these ads? I mean, what's funny, I think this video is a great ad. I think all of these ads are obviously bad. You would not run them on their own. Um, Cause that could be a fun video. I could yoink this and twist it by just removing the zoomer editing. <laughs> I could literally just yoink this and then the only twist is that I don't have zoomer editing. Um, that seems like not a bad idea. And you. How did I know? Oh, he's popping off, pop off. He could have made the background a little cleaner for $500. I'm sorry. <laughs> what is that? Yeah, for him to clean up his room and like iron the shirt in the background, that's that's $1,000. Yeah. $500? I don't want to see a single Funko pop in the frame. Wait, did he edit that in or is that just a, a plate with a feastable score? I genuinely can't tell. You know what? Just because of that, it's worth the $500. Oh, Thank you, man. sir. Mr. Beast asked us to make a commercial for feastables. The budget was $500. We made feastable s'mores instead. Best decision ever. We also <laughs> made this. Oh, this is really good. This is the first actual real commercial so far. Thanks for the chocolate, Feastles. You're welcome. I mean, it had beautiful shots, but that wasn't really an ad. That was more of them just saying hi to me. Let's see how the $750 commercial turned. Uh, that's more like good. Millionaire shitting on them so much for no reason. Well, <laughs> just because he's a millionaire, if you pay someone $500 for a commercial and it's not good, you can. <laughs> you don't have to say it's good. You know, he can laugh at it. I think that's fine. I think I think he's got. I think, I think that's fine. Uh, he, they paid the price. Like he can do what he want with it, which is to make a content video of them getting better. Turned out. Beast anime. Cool. This is so cool. Oh. Oh. Yeah, yes! that's really cool. This is awesome. Was, All right, I'll say it. I was going to say it. I'll say it. It was a little short. Well, animation yeah, takes a long time. Right? I agree. It was awesome. I love the quality. It made me look way cooler than I do in real life. All of that, yes. just a little short. If that was $750, I wonder what the $10,000 one looks like. Sign posting. It's so good. This is really uncomfortable. I don't think we should put this on TV. <laughs> that's... This is a commercial. Nothing makes me. This is like those terrible subway ads. <laughs> or the Quiznos, I'm sorry. <laughs> this is like those terrible Quiznos ads. Mix a little bit with those terrible PSP ads. You want to uh, buy chocolate like rats eating it. <laughs> uh, I can't tell if this is good for our brand or not, but it's funny. <laughs> All right, now the $1,000 commercial. We're dropping Thowies. The zoom in. Oh, Tariq would nerd out about this. Wow. Tariq's like, All right, this is the best one yet. Oh, that was sweet. I'm sorry, but I'm not kissing somebody the second to eat chocolate. Oh, they bought a jersey. High effort. Oh, no, he's out of Feastables. If you're wondering where you can buy Feastables, go to Walmart. Go to Walmart. $2,000. Now we're starting to get it? to the beefy. For a thousand bucks? The the shots were fine, but that was the most boring commercial I've ever seen. <laughs> that was the most generic ads I've ever seen. For a thousand bucks, bro. You put that on. That, that was that was forgettable in the instant you're watching it. I go back to the fucking weird rats. The price point. I thought it was chocolate, not beef. My bad. Whoa, That's... it's a film set. That, that looks cool. Oh, I like this song. Oh, this is a meta commercial. The whole point is shooting a commercial about shooting a commercial. They make the product look good. There we go. That's a cool shot. Oh. Whoa. Oh, it fell. Ha ha, quirky. Oh, this is still going. I mean, you paid a lot of money. <laughs> I, I did pay two grand, so. Three, two, one. <laughs> Why was that funny, dude? Because <laughs> they just poured milk oh. on it. Nice. Oh, that was the yeah. ending. I don't get it. My head hurts. It feels Next. Uh, bad. Uh, have you seen the ones where it's like, how, if someone could find one of these, I'd love to watch it. It's, it's where like, holy shit. Watch till the end, bro was really cooking. And it's like a guy with a camera zoomed in on a product and he's like tossing powdered sugar over it and like moving around and like all. <laughs> but then the final video is fucking terrible. Like, <laughs> barely none of it. It looks like it's setting up for like an most amazing. <laughs> 
First time I saw one of those, it cracked me up. It was, it was a very, very good bait and switch. Uh, also, good pause here on Jimmy Beast. This should be the commercial. Um, yeah, then there's a million videos of the same joke. But the first time I saw it, I thought it was very funny. Um, He's got veiny hands. I understand why his veins are popping out. As bad as some of these are, they're better than the Super Bowl ads. I mean, I agree. I agree because some of these show the product. <laughs> I mean, so the Super Bowl ads was like 17 celebrities talking about random quips. And at the end, in a fucking small font, they might mention the problem. I mean, it was just bad. It was like, it was one of the worst years of Super Bowl commercials in history for like actual good ads promoting a product. But um... oh, look how tight his watch is. <laughs> Jeez, tight watch. Oh You're my God. Circulation. Yeah. Needs to clean the nails a little bit. I'm sorry. All right. First the veins, second the nails. $30,000. He couldn't go get a manicure first. I think your nails are fine. Hey, tight watch. Yeah. I respect you. Oh, that's a that's a pretty shot. <laughs> that's it. What? Oh, I hope your watch falls off, bro. Now it's time for the $5,000 commercial. Okay, What's that for 5K? 5K is real money. <laughs> Editing's crazy. 5K should be a good ad. $5,000, all you have to do is make a chocolate bar look good. There should be some something. something you, also, you know you're doing it for Mr. Beast, so it's like a chance to put game out there, you know? Charge 5,000 for an ad, it's pretty good in this video. That's like the free ad for your service as a marketer. I feel like... No commercial! Yeah! Wow. Loud equals funny. If you were me four years ago. <laughs> well, now Jimmy. <laughs> I wouldn't say it's only four years ago, right? We've been watching right now. We're watching right now. I, I, I know that you have been doing more storytelling in your main channel videos. I get that. I do understand that. But I would not say that that joke makes sense in the context of what I've seen so far in this video. <laughs> All right, let's see this ad. Whoa! Whoa. <laughs> I thought that was no. not chocolate. Are you eating my Feastables? No, man. It wasn't me. I can see it all over your face. It isn't even feasible that I feasted on the Feastables. I've been on the farm all day fantasizing about those Feastables. It's an entirely new formula. It is. Brownie points for mentioning the new formula. Brownie controlling. points for his yeah. cheetah print pants. Hey, guys. Where's the dog <laughs> Okay. <laughs> That's gross. <laughs> but, like, what... <laughs> uh, I gotta be honest with you implying that your customers look like this and eat dog shit <laughs> it's like bad brand association for a commercial it's like generally like it, people don't want to emulate what they're um, seeing uh, also, the premise is a little odd. I know I'm nitpicking here, but the guy comes in and he's like, where are my Feastables? And there's a pile of them unopened right here. He's like, did you eat all the Feastables? And like, yes, he has chocolate on his mouth, but there's like a pile of, like there's plenty of Feastables to go around. So that, that part threw me off a little bit too. Like that feels like that could be solved. Um, Told you. Oh, now he's eating his Feastables. It is better. I don't like. I love that. Find your favorite flavor from milk chocolate. Milky, That's milky. disgusting. Milk crunch, milky, milky, milky. Feastables. They're better than dog shit. Points off for swearing. Yes. I'm More importantly, though. Feastables, they're better than dog shit. <laughs> you know what? I take it back. That's one of the hardest marketing lines I've ever heard. Feastables, they're better than dog shit. Wow. What else? That's Don Draper. <laughs> <laughs> Fucking picture of this, bro. He takes takes a drink. <laughs> uh, that's fucking crazy. That's crazy. Feastables, they're better than dog shit. Uh, where to put this? So, I want you to comment down below, did that make you want to go buy chocolate from Walmart? That's the best one yet. Now we have a second $5,000 commercial. We sent to everyone a bunch of our new bars, and on top of that, if they requested me to film footage, I filmed it and sent it to them. This is the first one to ask me to film something. Let's see how they used it. Crazy they wouldn't use 
that. This is so cool. Whoa, it's got a dog. I'm already on board. Tell me that my bad vibes are hitting the streets. What is going on? This is gonna change the world. <laughs> some point, we'll see the Feastables chocolate, I assume. Or not, maybe <laughs> they just, okay, there we yeah. go. We finally yeah. see the product. Deliver these and make them smile. Hey! Oh, oh no. Up. What's in the briefcase, happy feet? <laughs> I'm gonna be saying that for the rest of my life. I'm not. Whoa. Oh look, they're doing good deeds now because they're Mr. Beast. Bro, what in the... Did this guy think... <laughs> Bro, how fucking hard is this for real? <laughs> how fucking hard is it is to show the chocolate, say it's tasty, do a little close-up on the fucking ingredients, and talk about how fucking Hershey sucks. That's what he's been doing in all his videos. It works really well. <laughs> we wanted a movie? Because I told them I wanted a commercial. That was a good shot. Delivered to the world. That was you. That was me. They asked me to film that clip. They literally went out of their way to ask you for a one second clip of you. And you put in 1% effort into it. <laughs> Beast like a beast, feastables.com. That was definitely a lot of effort. And now, the moment you've all been waiting for. I know okay. I have. Let's see what I- So they've all been bad. Like, we can agree that none of these commercials has been particularly inspired. But this one, this is the $10,000 commercial. By God. By God, this one's gonna bring it home. I have a very, very good feeling, okay? This one, for $10,000, we're all gonna be shopping at Feastables tonight. A $10,000 commercial is. Better be good. Halloween. Right. I got some trick-or-treaters. Trick-or-treat! They took the whole thing? This guy looks like he'd steal some chocolate. Oh, the product looks very good in that shot. Oh no, bisexual lighting. This is shot so well. It's a pirate, oh gosh. Are they gonna steal more candy? Trick or treat. I have to say, I do feel for the commercial creators because the worst way to have your commercial experienced is with this editing over the top of it. <laughs> I can't even focus on the goddamn ad because it keeps cutting in people describing what I'm seeing. So maybe, I don't know if I would like it more or less, but I'm a, so far, I mean, the concept, like, he steals the candy. Lighting. This it. is shot so well. It's a pirate. Oh, gosh. Are they going to steal more candy? Trick or treat. <laughs> I'm a banana. He just can't get enough candy. Wait, why? She's going to re-ring it? It's going to have a different costume on. Oh, I knew it. Twinkle twee. That was really uncomfortably gross. Man, didn't I tell you to get... Trick or treat. Happy Halloween, fellas. Yeah, that cowboy just looks like people I went to high school with. I'm down for this. I like this. Feastables, world's best chocolate. I mean, I'll, I, I, <laughs> to be fair, I gave him chocolate bars with no direction. I don't know if these would convert to sales, but they're funny. So if these commercials made you want to try Feastables, go to Walmart and try our milk chocolate bar. But I feel like these commercials, if I had a net Feastables positivity score, it has gone down. It has only hurt. It is only hurt. It's negative. It's a drag. I feel like I am going to picture that weird guy in a baby outfit as... Um, uh, but you got a video out of it. Uh, I'm assuming... What do the comments say? Imagine a million dollar commercial. Don't have to imagine. <laughs> Go watch the Super Bowl. <laughs> uh, well, I'm convinced. Yeah, I do think the animated one was pretty good. Um, the anime one with, I mean, that could have been longer, but that was fine. That was fine. Huh, interesting. Okay, well, uh, bot comments? No, they're probably just children, bro. They're probably just children. We didn't learn too much from that video. I will be honest with you. Uh, well, actually, maybe we did. Mr. Beast is a chocolate company at this point. Mr. Beast is a media company with a chocolate arm. <laughs> a, a high margin chocolate arm. 
He's got a low margin media business that basically spends all the money it makes uh, and doesn't make very much and then uses that visibility to sell chocolate uh, at a high markup, which is very profitable. Yeah, it's like making cartoons to sell toys, exactly. Um, um, do you think Mr. Beast gets paid or gets some kind of better deal for mentioning Walmart so much? Yeah, he's almost, he's 100% signed a deal with Walmart. Um, yeah, 100%. I don't know if it's a sponsorship, but it's probably like he had, like maybe they have to mention Walmart first or most. Um, are you going to sell high margin sausage? <laughs> if I start doing direct uh, glizzy sales online that I promote during my streams. It's a really good way for me to make money. Coffee, direct coffee, coffee to your door, subscription service, coffee. <laughs> the Coffee Cow Club, you have to sign up and you get coffee beans delivered to your door. Uh, wow, that is a powerful business idea. Um... What is this? I don't want that. Um, what's, what time is it? One check. I'm gonna plan my day here. Uh, okay. Let's watch a good video, a Veritasium video. Let's watch a Veritasium video and get actually smarter, okay? Let's actually get fucking smarter. The trillion dollar equation. Hmm? And for Let's watch the trillion dollar equation. This single equation spawned four multi-trillion dollar into- Wait. Fucking got Mr. Beast chocolate on my screen? Industries ...and transformed everyone's approach to risk. Do you think that most people are aware of the size, scale, utility of derivatives? No, no idea. But at its core, this equation comes from physics, from discovering atoms, understanding like how heat is transferred, of and how to beat the casino at blackjack. So maybe it shouldn't be surprising that some of the best to beat the stock market were not veteran traders, but physicists, scientists, and mathematicians. In 1988, a mathematics professor named Jim Simons set up the... This is true, uh, but I do want to point out that Isaac Newton... Mm. Watch this. Oh, he talks about Newton in the vid? Ah, fuck. All right. <laughs> fuck. <laughs> Fuck. I thought I didn't think they had mentioned Isaac Newton in the mid. Medallion Investment Fund. And every year for the next 30 years, the Medallion Fund delivered higher returns than the market average. And not just by a little bit, it returned 66% per year. At that rate of growth, $100 invested in 1988 would be worth $8.4 billion today. Sheesh. This made Jim Simons easily the richest mathematician of all time. But being good at math doesn't guarantee success in financial markets. Just ask Isaac Newton. Ah, fuck. <laughs> in 1720, Newton was 77 years old and he was rich. He had made a lot of money working as a professor at Cambridge for decades. <laughs> And he had a side hustle as the master of the royal mint. His net worth was 30,000 pounds, the equivalent of $6 million today. Now to grow his... I will say, he's going to talk about South Sea Bubble, but um, I'm assuming he's not going to say this. The parallels to things like Bitcoin, crypto, <laughs> uh, NVIDIA, there, there's strong... Parallels, bro. There's strong parallels. 
of the way people, even in this chat, act, where it's like, you you get more excited about buying the higher the price is, which is the opposite of how it's supposed to be. It's like the more it's already priced in as expensive, you're like, wait, it must be good. Now I have to get in. <laughs> and it's like, it's supposed to be the opposite, bro. You're supposed to, you know what you wanna buy when it's low, sell when it's high. Uh, Fortune, Newton invested in stocks. One of his big bets was on the South Sea Company. Their business was shipping enslaved Africans across the Atlantic. Business was booming and the share price grew rapidly. By April of 1720, the value of Newton's shares had doubled, so he sold his stock. But the stock price kept going up. And by June, Newton- It's good enough to screenshot, it's good enough to sell, Newton. <laughs> You should have taken your double and fucking been happy, bro. And bought back in, and he kept buying shares even as the price peaked. When the price started to fall, Newton didn't sell. He bought more shares, thinking he was buying the dip. But there was no rebound, and ultimately he lost around a third of his wealth. When asked why he didn't see it coming, Newton responded, I can calculate the motions of the heavenly bodies, but not the madness of people. This animation fucking rules. God, I want to get this. I need to get this for videos, dude. This makes your videos so much sicker. I would have had a PowerPoint with this screenshotted. <laughs> this is fucking sick. Uh... So what did Simons get right that Newton got wrong? Well, for one thing, Simons was able to stand on the shoulders of giants. The pioneer of using math to model financial markets was Louis Bachelier, born in 1870. Both of his parents died when he was 18 and he had to take over his father's wine business. He sold the business a few years later and moved to Paris to study physics. But he needed a job to support himself and his family, and he found one at the Bourse, the Paris Stock Exchange. And inside was Newton's madness of people in its rawest form. Hundreds of traders screaming prices, making hand signals, and doing deals. Gang signs. The thing that captured Bachelier's interest were contracts known as options. The earliest known options were bought around 600 BC by the Greek philosopher Thales Damn. of Miletus. He believed that the coming summer would yield a bumper crop of olives. To make money off this idea, he could have purchased olive presses, which, if he were right, would be in great demand but he didn't have enough money to buy the machines. So instead, he went to all the existing olive press owners and paid them a little bit of money to secure the option to rent their presses in the summer for a specified price. When the harvest came, Thales was right. There were so many olives that the price of renting a press skyrocketed. Thales paid the press owners their pre-agreed- That seems genius, but like in real life, <laughs> you know, you show up at the guy's shop and he's like, ah, oh, it broke. It broke, it broke, sorry. <laughs> and then secretly he's running it out the back for fucking 3X the price. Cause <laughs> you know, it's, it's like, they're like, they just don't, they don't fucking, it's, it's tough to trust this. Uh... Price, and then he rented out the machines at a higher rate and pocketed the difference. Thales had executed the first known call option. A call option gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy something at a later date for a- Or it's rented already? Well, no, the point is he's paying for the right to rent it. So they can't, they can't rent it to someone else. But like, you know, if they're like, wait, I made a bad deal. You gave me a tiny bit of money and now I'm renting you this thing for cheap when I could just go to anyone else and rent it for really high. Then like, you know, <laughs> uh, unless it's like a legally enforceable contract then they'll screw you. They'll find a way to screw you. They'll fucking, they'll say it's broken or, the, you know. A set price known as the strike price. You can also buy a put option, which gives you the right, but not the obligation to sell something at a later date for the strike price. Put options are useful if you expect the price to go down. Call options are useful if you expect the price to go up. For example, let's say the current price of Apple stock is $100, mm -hmm. but you expect it to go up. You could buy a call option for $10 that gives you the right, but not the obligation to buy Apple stock in one year for $100. That is the strike price. Just a little side note, American options can be exercised on any date up to the expiry, whereas European options must be exercised on the expiry date. 
To keep things simple, we'll stick to European options. So if in a year the price simple. of Apple stock has gone up to $130, you can use the option to buy shares for $100 and then immediately sell them for $130. After you take into account the $10 you paid for the option, you've made a $20 profit. Alternatively, if in a year the stock price has dropped to $70, you just wouldn't use the option and you've lost the $10 you paid for it. So the profit and loss diagram looks like this. If the stock price ends up below the strike price, you... So what he's saying is you should always do it. Because you can only lose a little bit, but you'll definitely eventually gain a lot. So all of your money should be punting into options, okay? Uh, you will strike it rich. Lose what you paid for the option. But if the stock price is higher than the strike price, then you earn that difference minus the cost of the option. There are at least three advantages of options. One is that it limits your downside. If you had bought the stock instead of the option and it went down to $70, you would have lost $30. And in theory, you could have lost 100 if the stock went to zero. The second benefit is options provide leverage. If you had bought the stock and it went up to $130, then your investment grew by 30%. Mm -hmm. But if you had bought the option, you only had to put up $10. So your profit of $20 is actually a 200% return on investment. On the downside, if you had owned the stock, your investment would have only dropped by 30%. Whereas with the option, you lose all 100%. Yeah. So with options trading, there's a chance to make much larger profits, but also much bigger losses. The third benefit is you can use options as a hedge. I think the original motivation for options was to figure out a way to reduce risk. And then of course, once people decided they wanted to buy insurance, that meant that there are other people out there that wanted to sell it for a profit, and that's how markets get created. So options can be an incredibly useful... Yeah, I mean, for, for decades, this is basically all options have been used for. <laughs> the idea of like random regular people getting into options to get rich is like very recent. It's like a, <laughs> it's almost like a pandemic era phenomenon. Like it's, it's, uh... Investing tool. But what Bichelier saw on the trading floor was chaos, especially when it came to the price of stock options. Even though they had been around for hundreds of years, no one had found a good way to price them. Traders would just bargain to come to an agreement about what the price should be. Given the option to buy or sell something in the future, it Can you seems sell your like option? a very yes. amorphous kind of a trade. People do. And so coming up with prices for these rather strange objects has been a challenge that's plagued a number of economists and business people for centuries. Now, Bachelier, already interested in probability, thought there had to be a mathematical solution to this problem. And he proposed this as his PhD like topic music. to his advisor, Henri Poincaré. Looking into the math of finance wasn't really something people did back then. But to Bachelier's surprise, Poincaré agreed. To accurately price an option, First, you need to know what happens to stock prices over time. The price of a stock is basically set by a tug of war between buyers and sellers. Yeah. When more people want to buy a stock, the price this goes is such up. such a good when graph. When more people want to sell a stock, the price goes down. But the number- I'm sorry, pause, but I'm just so impressed with the production of this video. <laughs> it's like, you know, I'm always trying to figure out ways to make topics like this more interesting. And like, they're doing such a good job with the visuals. It's like really good. It's very impressive. Uh, uh, I'm I'm doing tricks on it, but I am. <laughs> I wish <laughs> we should bring back the Mr. Beast editing though. I, th I think his face should pop in and all these and be like, "What? That's a lot of people. That's a lot of people. Whoa, that stock's going low. That would be. I think that would add a little bit more, um, a little more hype to it. But obviously, not everybody can be Mr. Beast level." of buyers and sellers can be influenced by almost anything, like the weather, politics, new competitors, innovation, and so on. So Bichelier realized that it's virtually impossible to predict all these factors accurately. So the best you can do is assume that at any point in time, the stock price is just as likely to go up as down. And therefore, over the long term, stock prices follow a random walk. Move I do want to go back real quick uh, with this amazing graph and try to explain something that's uh, <laughs> that's happening right now. 
So this is how the stock market has worked historically. You know, this big tug of war between buyers and sellers. But one unique fact of the last 30 years and particularly increasing over time is that imagine instead of people over here, like there's some people, but there's also a big gigantic robot a thoughtless, unblinking robot that goes, have money, will buy. <laughs> and that represents passive investing. That is like half of Americans' retirements. And that thing doesn't think. It doesn't think. It doesn't uh, It doesn't look at the market. It has no ideas. It has no uh, estimates on the future. It just, it just gets paycheck money every month and buys everything. Doesn't matter what. <laughs> and so you'll notice because of that, that would drag the line up. Over time, having a robot that's bigger than all these people that's pulling every month would drag the line up, which has been happening uh, to an increasing degree. Um, so it's a good thing? It's a good thing, assuming we don't have a population bubble where we end up having more people pulling out of the market with passive than putting in for example, if we have a lot of old people and not many young people, and when old people get retirement age, they start pulling money out and the robot switches sides, okay? And then it starts pulling out of the money every month, okay? Then it's the same problem in reverse. <laughs> Again, this is all, this is all, um, I, I don't know, cutting edge. It's like, this is new stuff people are talking about. It's not. Assume that 100 at any point science. in time, the stock price is just as likely to go up as down. Um, and therefore, over the long term, stock prices follow a random walk. I will have 500 kids to fix this problem. Damn, you can fuck. <laughs> this chatter is going to be a rabbit, bro. And he's out here to fucking eat. You and Elon Musk are going to save us. Moving up and down as if their next move is determined by the flip of a coin. Randomness is a hallmark of an efficient market. By efficient, economists typically mean that you can't make money by trading. The idea that you shouldn't be able to buy an asset and sell it immediately for a profit is known as the efficient market hypothesis. The more people try to make money by predicting the stock market and then trading on those predictions, the less predictable those prices are. If you and I could predict the stock market tomorrow, then we would do it. We would start trading <laughs> today on stocks that we thought were gonna go up tomorrow. Well, if we did that, then instead of going up tomorrow, they would go up now as we bought more and more of the stock. So the very act of predicting actually affects the quality of the future outcomes. And so in a totally efficient market, the, the prices tomorrow can't possibly have any predictive power. If they did, we would have taken advantage of it today. What's uh, relevant to this as well that I think is really interesting. I just did a kind of a deep dive on this just out of my own interest on the way sports betting is run. Um, it's very interesting the way they set the odds lines on sports betting. What they do is like a very, a small or, um, you know, not a major player casino will set the line first. They'll be like, you know, I don't know if it's Bulls versus Lakers. They'll be like Lakers plus two, whatever. They'll, they'll set the line first and they'll set the max bet really small. So like if they're wrong, if they think, you know, if they think Lakers are favored to win and they're wrong, then smarter gamblers will come in and make a bunch of bets on the Bulls, but they can only bet so much. It's a very limited max bet. And as the bets come in, they will start to adjust the odds based on these bets. So there's the max they can lose is very little. And then other bigger casinos will see that, wait for the first person to go and get the first notoriety and learn. Then they take that and they, they take that updated line and do the exact same thing. And it radiates out from there to bigger bets, but let you know more stable casinos. Um, yeah, to try and get the wisdom of the crowds. Like it's not some smart sports better. It's not some guy in Vegas who's like, I am the most incredible genius at knowing sports and I will beat all these gamblers by setting the perfect odds. They, they have smart people on their team to set their initial line, but like once they do that, they're often proven wrong by the crowd, but it radiates out of people trying it until they get, until they get to the mass crowd effect. Um, 
And then their goal is just to make money on the fees in the edge. They don't, they don't, they don't they want to be neutral. So the bets are on both sides, um, which is what they're trying to set with the odds. So it's pretty good. It's good. It's a cool system. Uh, Can't they just rig the game and win money? I think, I mean, anyone could do that. <laughs> if you have the power to make Steph Curry lose the game, like if you can just tell him to throw the game, then you have a way to make money. It's unethical, it's illegal, they'll probably catch you eventually, but yes, anyone anyone could do that. <laughs> if you have the power to change the game, you can rig it and make money. But I don't, I don't you know, other than refs who have, who have done this <laughs> refs have done this uh and been caught for it uh no one else really has that power unless a player wants to bet on themselves and throw which is hugely risky for their career um this is why sports betting is illegal yeah i mean there's there's a lot to be said where like the incentives start to get pretty bad right uh obviously nba players are paid very well but like there's people, maybe you're a coach or maybe, you know, a coach to play. I mean, but a ref, a ref is paid fine, but like could make a lot more money if they just made a couple calls go one way and suddenly they change the game. <coughs> That's the risk, right? Um, this is a Galton. And in esports, players, players in esports don't get paid that well, um, especially like if you're not top, top. And so there's a lot of incentive for them to throw. Like this happened in Korean StarCraft. They were sent to jail over it. It was a huge scandal. There was a player who was considered one of the best players ever. He was in the Hall of Fame. They took his banner down and like burned it. <laughs> his name was Savior. He won a bunch of tournaments. He was kind of over the hill. He was kind of like past his prime. Maybe LeBron in a, in a few years. You know, not, not super top. And he match fixed. He bet against himself and then threw a bunch of games. And they caught him. And it ruined his whole legacy. They took him out of the history books. They took him out of all, stripped all his titles. Um, yeah, they made laws over it. Yeah, so it happens. Board. It's got rows of pegs arranged in a triangle. Is that what win trading is? No, win trading is like um, usually for a ladder. Like if you're in, you know, grandmaster and you want to get the challenger, you log on and queue at the same time as your buddies. And they get on the other team and they throw, so you win. <coughs> um, you know, it's like... Win training is not like the pro matches, usually. That's not really what that is. Um, and around 6,000 tiny ball bearings that I can pour through the pegs. Now, each time a ball hits a peg, there's a 50-50 chance it goes to the left or the right. So each ball follows a random walk as it passes through these pegs which makes it basically impossible. Isn't this the game XUC plays for tens of thousands of dollars? <laughs> Isn't this like Gamba, 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 press, 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 press. Fucking. <laughs> uh, I didn't know I was watching a fucking gambling channel, bro. You think you're watching Veritasium trying to learn, and then it turns out it's a fucking gambling ad. Well, to predict the path of any individual ball, but if I flip this over, what you can see is that all the balls together always create a predictable pattern. Wow. That is, a collection of random walks creates a normal distribution. It's centered around the middle because the number of paths a ball could take to get here is the greatest, and the further out you go, the fewer the paths a ball could take to get there. Like, if you want to end up here, well, the ball would have to go left, 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 all the way down. So there's only one way to get here, but to get into the middle, there are thousands of paths that a ball could take. Now, Bichelle Okay, but theoretically, one time you do this, but couldn't they all just fucking... <laughs> every single one bounces to the left every single time, and it fills the whole fucking pipe? On an infinite timeline? And that's why tomorrow we are doing the, we're going to flip this little thing until that happens stream. <laughs> I'm going to sit here with one of those and I'm going to flip it back and forth. And we're going to do it over and over until we get all of them in the left column. It's going to be the sickest fucking stream. I'm going to be doing it for, 
a quadrillion years. <clears throat> but to get into the middle, there are thousands of paths that a ball could take. Now, Bachelier believed a stock price is just like a ball going. When believe hits, I'm going to be rich. <laughs> Fucking Yeti's withered hands doing the gamba for thousands of years. Yes, no. <laughs> Fucking doubters sucked up every single point in the economy. <laughs> There's one guy left hooked up to an AI with one Atra coin. Wins a quadrillion X bet set for life. Going through a Galton board. Each. What if you hit it day one? It would be so swag if I flipped it over and it hits it all day one. <laughs> Additional layer of pegs represents a time step. So after a short time, the stock price could only move up or down a little. But after more time, a wider range of prices is possible. According to Bichelier, the expected future price of a stock is described by a normal distribution, centered on the current price, which spreads out over time. Bachelier realized he had rediscovered the exact equation which describes how heat radiates from regions of high temperature to regions of low temperature. This was first discovered by Joseph Fourier so back in 1822. It. He yoinked it. So Bachelier called his discovery the radiation. So basically his homework was due, his thesis was due, and he said, fuck, I don't have an equation for uh, pricing stocks, so I'm going to steal this heat one. <laughs> <laughs> and no one will fucking know. I see. Interesting. ...of probabilities. Since he was writing about finance, the physics community didn't take any notice. But the mathematics of the random walk would go on to solve an almost century-old mystery in physics. In 1827, Scottish botanist Robert Brown was looking at pollen grains under the microscope. And he noticed that the particles suspended in water on the microscope slide were moving around randomly. Because he didn't know whether it was something to do with the pollen being living material, he tested non-organic particles, such as dust from lava and meteorite rock. Again, he saw them moving around in this. What's this guy's name? Scott Brownman? Might be my ancestor, bro. <laughs> we might be related, I'm noticing. Uh, some kind of... So then I feel a kinship for sure. <clears throat> Same way. So Brown discovered that any particles, if they were small enough, exhibited this random movement, which came to be known as Brownian motion. But what caused it remained a mystery. 80 years later, in 1905, Einstein figured out the answer. Einstein. Over the previous couple hundred years, the idea that gases and liquids were made up of molecules became more and more popular. But not everyone was convinced that molecules were real in a physical sense, just that the theory explained a lot of observations. The idea led Einstein to hypothesize that Brownian motion is caused by the trillions of molecules hitting the particle from every direction every instant. Occasionally, more will hit from one side than the other, and the particle will momentarily jump. To derive the mathematics, Einstein supposed that, as an observer, we can't see or predict these collisions with any certainty. So at any time, we have to assume that the particle is just as likely to move in one direction as another. So just like stock prices, microscopic particles move like a ball falling down a Galton board. The expected location of a particle is described by a normal distribution which broadens with time. It's why, even in completely still water, microscopic particles spread out. This is diffusion. By solving the Brownian motion mystery, Einstein had found definitive evidence that atoms and molecules exist. Of course, he had no idea that Bichelier had uncovered the random walk five years earlier. By the time Bichelier finished his PhD, he had finally figured out a mathematical way to price an option. Remember okay. that with a call option, if the future price of a stock is less than the strike price, then you lose the premium paid for the option. But if the stock price is greater than the strike price, you pocket that difference, and you make a net profit if the stock has gone up by more than you paid for the option. So the probability that an option buyer makes a profit is the probability that the price increases by more than the price paid for it, which is the green shaded area. 
And the probability that the seller makes money is just the probability that the price stays low enough that the buyer doesn't earn more than they paid for it. This is the red shaded area. Multiplying the profit or loss by the probability of each outcome, Bichelier calculated the expected return of an option. Now, how much should it cost? If the price of an option is too high, no one will want to buy it. Conversely, if the price is too low, people want to buy it. <laughs> it happens every day. <laughs> on fucking uh, NVIDIA day, zero day fucking <laughs> call options <laughs> that are overpriced for what your risk return is. People will buy it. Wall Street bets will buy it, bro. <laughs> Even if your chance of return is basically nil, some fucking idiot will buy it. All you gotta do is tell them that like, it's going to the moon. Oh, everyone will want to buy it. Bichelier argued that the fair price is what makes the expected return for buyers and sellers equal. Both parties should stand to gain or lose the same amount. That was Bichelier's insight into how to accurately price an option. When if you somehow sold negative one day till expirations, people would still buy them. So an option that <laughs> you're betting that the price will go up yesterday. <laughs> Yeah, that's good. I, you know what? Someone might. If you make it, you make it attractive enough. <laughs> Someone might. Uh... When Bichelier finished his thesis, he had beaten Einstein to inventing the random walk and solved a problem that had eluded options traders for hundreds of years. But no one noticed. The physicists were uninterested, and traders weren't ready. The key thing missing was a way to make a ton of money. Hey, so I'm not sure how stock traders sleep at night with billions of dollars riding on the madness of people, but I have been sleeping just fine thanks to the sponsor of this video, 8sleep. I've recently moved to Australia and it has been really hot, but I've been keeping cool at night using the 8sleep pod. It's a smart mattress cover that can control the temperature of the bed and track how well you sleep. How long? You can set the temperature to whatever you like from around 13 degrees. I'll say this, I'll add to the ad, okay, so we can skip it. I have an 8sleep and I like it. So use the Veritasium's code right here and check it out if you want it. They are kind of pricey though. Um, yeah, but I like it. In the 1950s, a young physics graduate, Ed Thorpe, was doing his PhD in Los Angeles. But a few hours drive away, Las Vegas was quickly becoming the gambling capital of the world. And Thorpe saw a way to make a fortune. He headed to Vegas and sat down at the blackjack table. Back then the dealer- Was it worth it? Um, I will say it's worth it because you can control the temperature on both sides of your bed. And Ari really likes the bed to be warm. And if the bed is warm, I can't fucking sleep at all. And that's been a problem for as long as we've known each other. And this kind of finally fixed it. But like in terms of like comfort, it's just totally a normal mattress, nothing special. And everything, I mean, the, the tracking's kind of cool. I don't think it's, I think if I didn't have this unique need to have a cold one half of the bed and a warm one half of the bed, I wouldn't think it's worth it, but I do. Uh, she likes it warm with the hell. I know, I don't get it at all. How could you possibly sleep in a, in a warm bed? Like a, like you can nap in a warm bed, I guess. But, but like when you get in bed at night, you don't, a, a bed that's like even a little bit toasty is fucking unreasonable. I can't, I can't possibly, I have to have it cold. And if I make it, uh, I used to just turn down the air and like, she would get mad. Cause so we, this is good. Um, this bed solves it. All I'm saying is my bed, my bed is ice cold one half and her half is warm. I can literally roll over to her half of the bed and feel the temperature increase. <laughs> it's like very noticeably different. And so that's like the cool part of the eight sleep. Uh, I have a freezer bed. Yeah, I have a freezer bed. Um, Taylor only used a single deck of cards so Thorpe could keep a mental note of all the cards that had been played as he saw them. This allowed him to work out if he had an advantage. He would bet a bigger portion of his funds when the odds were in his favor and less when they weren't. It's like Bellatro! He had invented card counting. This is a remarkable innovation considering blackjack had been around in various forms for hundreds of years. And for a while, this made him a lot of money. But the casinos got wise to his strategy and they added more decks of cards to the game to reduce the benefit of card counting. So Thorpe 
took his winnings to what he called the biggest casino on earth, the stock market. Oh. He started a hedge fund that would go on to make a 20% return every year for 20 years, the best performance ever seen at that time. That's insane. And he did it by transferring the skills he honed at the blackjack table to the stock market. Thorpe pioneered a type of hedging, a way to protect against losses with balancing or compensating transactions. Thorpe did it mathematically. He looked at the odds of winning and losing and decided that under certain conditions, you can actually tilt the odds in your favor by using certain patterns to be able to make bets. Suppose Bob sells Alice a call option on a stock, and let's say the stock has gone up, so now it's in the money for Alice. Well now, for every additional $1 the stock price goes up, Bob will lose $1. But he can eliminate this risk by owning one unit of stock. Then if the price goes up, he would lose $1 from the option, but gain that dollar back from the stock. And if the stock drops back out of the money for Alice, he sells the stock so he doesn't risk losing any money from that either. This is called dynamic hedging. It means Bob can make a profit with minimal risk from fluctuating stock prices. A hedged portfolio pi at any one time will offset the option V with some amount of stock delta. It basically means I can sell you something without having to take the opposite side of the trade. And the way to think about it is I have synthetically manufactured an option for you. I've created it out of nothing <laughs> by doing dynamic trading, dynamic hedging. As we saw with Bob's example, delta, the amount of stock he has to hold, changes depending on current prices. Mathematically, it represents how much the current option price changes with a change in the stock price. But Thorpe wasn't satisfied with Bichelier's model for pricing options. I mean, for one thing, stock prices aren't entirely random. They can increase over time if the business is doing well, or fall if it isn't. Bichelier's model ignored this, so Thorpe came up with a more accurate model for pricing options, which took this drift into account. I actually oh, it's him. figured out what this model was back in the middle of 1967. It's pretty impressive. And I decided that I would just use it for myself, and then <laughs> later I kept it quiet for my own investors. The idea was to basically make a lot of money out of it for everybody. His strategy was, if the option was going cheap, according to his model, buy it. If it was overvalued, short sell it, that is, bet against it. And that way, more often than not, he would end up on the winning side of the trade. This lasted until 1973. In that year, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes came up with an equation that changed the industry. Robert Merton independently published his own version, which was based on the mathematics of stochastic calculus, so he is also credited. I thought I'd have the field to myself, but unfortunately, Fisher Black and Myron Scholes published the idea. And they did a better job of the model than I did because they had uh, very tight mathematics behind their yeah, but derivation. They got years of like Bichelier, they thought that option profit. prices should offer a fair bet to both buyers and sellers. But their approach was totally new. They said if it was possible to construct a risk-free portfolio of options and stocks just like Thorpe was doing with his delta hedging, then in an efficient market, a fair market, this portfolio should return nothing more than the risk-free rate, what the same money would earn if invested in the safest asset, U.S. Treasury bonds. The assumption was yeah. that if you're not taking on any additional risk, then it shouldn't be possible to receive any extra returns. Mm -hmm. To describe how stock prices change over time, Black, Scholes, and Merton used an improved version of Bachelier's model, just like Thorpe. This says that at any time we expect the stock price to move randomly, plus a general trend up or down. Like a Tokyo drift. drift. By combining these two equations, Black, Scholes, and Merton came up with the most famous equation in finance. It relates the price of any kind of contract to any asset, stocks, bonds, you name it. The same year they published this equation, the Chicago Board Options Exchange was founded. Why is that equation so important? Like for finance, how did that change the game? Well, because when you solve that partial differential equation, you get an explicit formula for the price of the option as a function of a bunch of these input parameters. And for the very first time, you now have an explicit expression where you plug in the parameters and out pops this number so that people can actually use it to trade on. 
This led to one of the fastest adoptions by industry of an academic idea in all of the social sciences. <laughs> Within just a couple of years, the Black-Scholes formula was adopted as the benchmark for Wall Street for trading options. The exchange-traded options market has exploded, and it's now a multi-trillion dollar industry. Do you think the this is a green screen? in this market has been doubling roughly every five years. So this is the financial equivalent of Moore's Law. There are other businesses that have grown just as quickly, like credit default swaps market, the OTC derivatives market, the securitized debt market. All of these are multi-trillion dollar industries that in one form or another make use of the idea of Black Scholes Merton option pricing. This opened up a whole new way to hedge against anything, and not just for hedge funds. Nowadays, pretty much every large company, yeah, governments, you could see and it by even years. individual investors use options to hedge against their own specific risks. Suppose you're running an airline and you're worried that an increase in oil prices would eat into your profits. Well, using the Black-Scholes-Merton equation, there's a way to accurately and efficiently hedge that risk. You price an option to buy something that tracks the price of oil, and that option will pay off if oil prices go up, and that will help compensate you for the higher cost of fuel you have to pay. So Black-Scholes-Merton can help reduce risk, but it can also provide leverage. An ongoing battle between bullish day <laughs> traders and hedge fund short sellers that have bet against the stock. GameStop shares have now risen some 700%. GME, well, GameStop baby, is a buy really interesting example Diamond for all hands. sorts of reasons, but options figured prominently in that example because a small cadre of users on this Reddit sub channel, Wall Street Bets, decided <laughs> that the hedge fund managers that were shorting the stock and betting that the company would go out of business needed to be punished. And so they <laughs> bought shares of GameStop stock to try to drive up price. Turns out that buying the stock was not enough because with a dollar's worth of cash, you can buy a dollar's worth of stock. But with a dollar's worth of cash, you can buy options that affected many more than a dollar's worth of stock. Perhaps in some cases, 10 or $20 worth of stock for a dollar's worth of options. And so there's natural leverage embedded in these securities. And so the combination of buying both the stock and the options caused the prices to rise very quickly. And what that did was to cause these hedge fund managers to lose a lot of money quickly. How big is this market for derivatives? Hooray. How big is this whole area that kind of comes? And what's important about that story is that no regular people lost money. Only hedge fund managers. The heroes won, the hedge fund managers lost, and at the end of the day, all of the regular people walked away with big gains. Nobody was lured into it. Uh... <laughs> all of the apes were together strong on AMC, on GME, on Bed Bath & Beyond. And at the end of the day, only the hedgies lost while the heroes won. Love that. I love that. It's out of Black Scholes Merton. <laughs> there are estimates of how large derivatives markets are. And first, let's be clear what a derivative is. A derivative is a financial security whose value derives from another financial security. So an option is an example of a derivative. In general, the size of derivative markets globally is the, on, on the order of several hundred trillion dollars. Sheesh. How does that compare to the size of the underlying securities they're based on? It's multiples of the underlying securities. I just have to interrupt because it seems kind of crazy. Obviously, this is not just like, um, you know, financialized paper obligations back and forth. There is a vault somewhere with hundreds of trillions of dollars of derivative money in it. And we, chat, we're gonna find it, we're gonna break in, and we're all gonna get rich, okay? All we have to do is find the derivative bank where they keep all this. <laughs> they don't want us to know about it. It's the one piece. <laughs> and if we work together, we can butt, get your shovel, someone bring a shovel, someone, we need an explosives guy, okay? It's gotta be like Ocean's 3000. <laughs> we need an explosives guy, we need like a smooth talker, we need a guy who knows how to like drive RV cars. Um, 
We need somebody to eat hamburgers a lot and look into the camera and be handsome. We need the Brad Pitt. <laughs> okay? We need like a thousand of you to be uh, Naruto runners. Um, I'll drive to forklift. <laughs> anyway, I think we can do it. I think we can do it. Easy that you have more money riding on the things that are based on the thing than the thing itself. That's right. So, t so tell me how that makes any sense. Because what options allow you to do is to take the underlying thing and turn it into 5, 10, 20, 50 things. So these pieces of paper that we call options and derivatives, they basically allow us to create many, many different versions of the underlying asset. Versions that individuals find more palatable because of their own risk reward preferences. Does this make the markets and the global economy more stable or less stable or no effect? All three. <laughs> so it turns out that during normal times, these markets are a very significant source of liquidity and therefore stability. During abnormal times, by that I mean when there are periods of market stress, all of these securities can go in one direction, typically down. Rapidly. And when they go down together, that creates a really big market crash. So in those circumstances, derivatives markets can exacerbate these kinds of market dislocations. In 1997, Merton and Scholes were awarded the Nobel Prize in Economics. Black was acknowledged for his contributions, but unfortunately he had passed away just two years earlier. We're gonna make a lot of money in options, but now uh, Black and Scholes have told everybody what the secret is. With the option pricing formula now out for everyone to see, hedge funds would need to discover better ways to find market inefficiencies. Enter Jim Simons. Before Simons had any exposure to the stock market, he was a mathematician. His work on Riemann geometry was instrumental in many areas of mathematics and physics, including knot theory, quantum field theory, and quantum computing. Churn Simons' theory laid the mathematical foundation for string theory. In 1976, the American Mathematical Society presented him with the Oswald Veblen Prize in Geometry. But at right, the top of his swag. academic career, Simons went looking for a new challenge. When he founded Renaissance Technologies in 1978, his strategy was to use machine learning to find <laughs> patterns in the stock market. Bro. 78, his strategy- Are you broke? Just get a MacBook. <laughs> Bro, what is this? This guy's fucking poor. This is crazy. This is using fucking CRT technology. Act like he's a big shot. Get a fucking MacBook, bro. If you're a broke boy, just get an NVIDIA car. I probably she doesn't even have a 4090 in it. Strategy was to use machine learning to find patterns in the stock market. Patterns provide opportunities to make money. The real thing was to gather a tremendous amount of data, and, and uh, we had to get it by hand in the early days. We went down to the Federal Reserve and copied interest rate histories and stuff like that, because it didn't exist on computers. His rationale was that the market is far too complex for anyone to be able to make predictions with certainty. But Simons had worked for the U.S. Institute for Defense Analysis during the Cold War, breaking Russian codes by extracting patterns from masses of data. Simons was convinced that a similar approach could beat the market. He then used his academic contacts to hire a bunch of the best scientists he could find. What was your cr employment criteria then? If they knew nothing about finance, what were you looking for in them? Uh, someone with a PhD in physics and who'd had uh, five years out and had written a few good papers and was obviously a smart guy, or in astronomy, uh, or in mathematics, or in statistics. Uh, someone who had done science and done it well. It's not surprising that mathematicians and physicists are involved in this field. First of all, finance pays a lot better than you know being an assistant professor of mathematics. Uh, and for a number of mathematicians, I do the, science every the, day. The beauty <laughs> of option pricing is equally compelling to anything else that they're doing in their professions. One of these was Leonard Baum, a pioneer of hidden Markov models. Just as Einstein realized that although we can't directly observe atoms, we can infer their existence through their effect on pollen grains, hidden Markov models aim to find factors that- Sorry, but it was weird. He mentioned physicists, right? He mentioned, um, you know, 
astronomy. He mentioned he didn't. I think he cut over streamers. <laughs> I don't. I didn't. I didn't hear streamers in there. It was weird. He was. He was looking for the best and the brightest, right? Did he? Do you think it cut out? I think it was implied. It was implied, right? It was implied. Or it was insinuated. <laughs> I was like, how are you going to go for Einstein and not get XQC? Do you know what I'm saying? It was just weird that he didn't mention that. Um, I think it was implied, but. That are not directly observable, but do have an effect on what we can observe. And soon after that, Renaissance launched their now famous medallion fund. Using hidden Markov models and other data-driven strategies, the Medallion Fund became the highest returning investment fund of all time. Jesus! This led Bradford Cornell of UCLA in his paper Medallion Fund, the Ultimate Counterexample, to conclude that maybe the efficient market hypothesis itself is wrong. In 1988, I published a paper testing it for the US stock market, and what I found was that the hypothesis is false. You can actually reject the hypothesis in the data. And so there are predictabilities in the stock market. So it's possible to beat the market is what you're saying. It's possible to beat the market if you have the right models, the right training, the uh, resources. If you buy zero day options on NVIDIA every single day, <laughs> I get it, I understand. Wink, wink, understood. It is 100% possible to beat the market if you sort Wall Street bets by controversial, find the top thing, and YOLO your life savings into it. I understand. I get it. Every day will be green. I also, I he's not saying this explicitly, but we're all hearing it. He's also saying that if a stock you buy ever goes down, that is an opportunity to, quote, buy the dip. And that means put more money at chase, good money after good money, to keep your your money train rolling. Now we're all hearing this, but I just want to make sure some people can't read between the lines like we can. Um, the computational power and so on and so forth, yes. The people who have found the patterns in the stock market, and the randomness for that matter, have often been physicists and mathematicians, but their impact has gone beyond just making them rich. By modeling market dynamics, they've Wait, what's the top post on Wall Street Bets right now? Just so we know what to invest in, chat. Let's make some money. You know what I'm saying? The top post right now is 12,000 upvotes in 10 hours. I made a minor miscalculation. You have a brokerage account deficit of $659,365 and can't open any... <laughs> okay, obviously some... Tiny examples. Just delete the app. Just delete the app, bro. Just delete the app. <laughs> Provided Just new insight app. into risk and opened up whole new markets. They've determined what the accurate price of derivatives should be. And in doing so, they have helped eliminate market inefficiencies. Ironically, if we are ever able to discover all the patterns in the stock market, knowing what they are will allow us to eliminate them. And then we will finally have a perfectly efficient market. Wait, Yeti, you're here? Let's cap this off with a little bit of uh, stock market gambling of our own. Uh, just put a bet, believe, doubt. <laughs> and I'll decide. I'll decide with my patented Black Shoals formula, okay? I will decide right now. Okay. I'm Black Shoals. This is truly a random formula. Okay. Uh, get your money, and this is a chance to make real money. This is a chance to change your life forever. You're going to sit on the sidelines? You're not going to put your points in? Okay, now here's the deal. I'm telling you right now. Wait, is the bet closed? Is the bet closed? Oh, it closed. Okay, I was going to do a whole thing. <laughs> okay. Uh, let's 
flip a coin. Here's what I'm going to do. I am naturally biased towards believers, as you well know, which is why the odds favor believe. Everyone knows this. However, I want it to be fair. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to flip a coin. If it's heads, believers win. If it's tails, we go again one time. <laughs> so in order for the doubters to win, there has to be two tails in a row. Are you ready? Flip a coin. Okay, that one doesn't count. We're gonna flip again because we get to see it. Here we go. Flip. <laughs> okay, why? Well, hey, they won fair and square. In fact, that was two heads in a row. Believers win! Believers win! Efficient market theory, dude. Absolutely efficient market theory. Uh, literally, you, I mean, you just lost straight up. We didn't even have to do the fucking... Uh, very powerful stuff. Very powerful. Wait, let me see if there's any more last part of this video. Sorry, I just... If there's like a... There's 30 seconds left market where all price movements are truly random. Wow. Hey, that was a fantastic video. I really enjoyed it. Uh, just incredible at, at what they do, which is making complex and interesting topics uh, understandable, which is something that I, you know, truly am interested in and aspire to. So I'm impressed and I learned a lot and I loved it. Uh, I'm gonna go to Jay Mook's birthday party. I'm sorry. So I'm gonna I'm gonna cut the stream short a little bit. Sorry, I've been doing a little bit shorter streams, but um, I do want to go to this birthday party. You know, it's I think it's a good thing to do as a friend. So I'm going to leave. I have this PowerPoint. I'm just gonna show it to you. Um, I have this PowerPoint of like, you know, dozens of articles about the nuclear power shutdown and crisis in Germany. <laughs> and uh, tracing the origin of the Green Party back to its fucking roots as a uh, <laughs> nuclear protest party in the 1980s. And I've got uh, all of this sourced and verified. I, I am not gonna go through it now. I don't even know if I feel the same energy I felt last night, but just no, just, just I want to say that um, if you have something to contribute to a topic, I'm happy to hear it. But if you think that I'm just, if I say a claim like, you know, Germany just shut down its nuclear power plants after years and they're having problems, like they've switched from a net exporter to a net importer of energy. I'm not making that up. I'm not, <laughs> I don't just make it up. I read this shit every single morning and then I follow up on the stories I'm interested in and I read more. And I find it very annoying when people write these fucking long ass paragraphs of bullshit, like literally bullshit. Like I read it, I'm like, this is not even verified fact at all. And then someone is going to come along who doesn't do any work and they're gonna read that comment and be like, oh, I guess I just, I, and I, it frustrates me. It frustrates me because you're not acting in good faith. Um, that's that. Now, I got to go. Um, I'm going to go to this party and salute and goodbye and have a great night. And um, I'm maybe live tomorrow if I really want to for fun. But I will be back on Monday with another Marketing Monday. We're going for three weeks in a row. We are going for a three week streak on Marketing Mondays. Oh, I think I'm actually gonna upload a video tomorrow on TikTok ban. I made a very interesting video. I recorded it today. We haven't edited it yet, but uh, on the TikTok ban and what's coming through with that, I think it's, there's a lot of funny stuff with it. Um, so there should be an offline video tomorrow. Ooh. All right, bye. Thanks. Interesting. Later.